Hey, everybody. Good morning. Good afternoon. Good evening. How's everybody doing? Uh, well, let me just clear this up. We don't need this up quite yet. It's me, Legal Vices, and here we are at the beginning of another Maritime Monday. We are keeping on straight on track with these. Um, sorry for the slight delay. Good to see you all here. How many, how many do we have here right now? We have 46 people here. Uh, hurry up, people. Get on over here so we can start the show. You know, we like to start when you get about 100 people here. Um, sorry, I was just a bit late. I'm a creature of habit, and uh, I loaded up everything on Chrome as I normally do. And then I remember that I hate Chrome, and I'm never going to stream from it again. So I had to <laughs> reset up everything on Microsoft Edge. So that took me a little bit of time to do that. But we're here. We are ready for yet another Maritime Monday today. Unfortunately, there is no whiskey tie-in, but we'll get to something here in just a minute. Um, today, today is another tough one. This is not a feel-good story at all. Uh, we had the, for the last two weeks, we've looked into the Shackleton expedition and sort of celebrated the triumph of humans over nature. Uh, not the case today. As you can tell from the title of the video, it's probably not going to be a feel-good story. The Penley Lifeboat Disaster. Um, anytime the word disaster is in it, doesn't bode well. Uh, so there we go. That's what we're going to be looking at today. And uh, just so you know what's coming up for this week, it's Monday. It's time to do our quick little mini uh, mini week in, re in preview, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. I'll tell you why I'm laughing here in a minute. Oh, gosh. All right. <laughs> That's funny. Uh, be with you in a second, sir. Uh, <laughs> all right. Well, <laughs> okay. Uh, the quick week in preview here. Tomorrow, we're going to be going into the Courtney Clenny uh, OnlyFans murder case. Uh, those of you that know of it, those of you that might not, uh, what happened is Courtney Clenny is an OnlyFans model who got really, really stabby on her boyfriend. Uh, we're going to look into the background of her, the background of the charges. We'll be listening to uh, some 911 tapes, reviewing some uh, other tapes. Uh, police have been involved with them more than once. So we'll look into that. On Tuesday, we'll give the background. And on Wednesday, and Wednesday we'll be we'll be going starting a, uh, a bond hearing. She wants out of jail before trial starts. So there's a bond hearing that that well, is already taking place, but uh, it's scheduled to be reviewed here on my show on Wednesday. Thursday, we'll be doing OJ Simpson, continuing F. Lee Bailey's cross-examination of racist cop Mark Furman. And then Friday, we will do day two of the Courtney Clenny bond hearing. And there's no spoilers because the judge will decide the bond issue on December 8th. Uh, now, why I was laughing, this sort of ties into this. Uh, Xcomer was the very first person to send a super chat today on Maritime Monday, where we'll be looking at the Penley lifeboat disaster. But he says, uh, have you and Steve thought about doing a show like Nate and Eric? Well, I don't know. Why don't we ask Steve? What? Hey, who's that? <laughs> That's Jeff. <laughs> yeah. What's <laughs> happening? Already, unbeknownst to them, you were hiding in the background. Uh, <laughs> Nate and Eric, uh, this, have we thought about doing a show like Nate and Eric? Who's Nate and Eric? Uh, Eric Hunley and, uh, Nate, uh, Nate that is suing Christopher Boozy, Nate of law tube, uh, lawyer guy. See, I'm Nate not a, one of these, I'm not a law yeah. tuber or whatever you call it. I mean, I, I know Andrew and then he introduced me to Nick and then I met you through yeah. Nick, but I mean, like, I'm not, I'm not any of these things. I'm just, I'm just here to hang out. I'm a, I'm a chatter. I'm like somebody who would hang out in the chats and then I would like, uh, and then some, somehow I got recruited. I don't know, but I'm enjoying it. In fact, I must say, I'm going to give you the honor. <laughs> I guess it's an honor. Maybe it's a dishonor. <laughs> It'll be the last the last show uh -huh. that I think I'm going to be on because um, I've got to go back to work. Mm. Well, not that I'm not at work. I've been working at home, but I actually work <laughs> at the office is what it is. And, I, and I'm, I've been sucked all my vacation dry, so now i am uh, got to go back to my real job. Well, the, the people are, as always, thrilled to see you here. We've got lots of, hey, Steve. Hi, hey, Steve. Steve. What's Hi, going love, on, Steve? See, I'm one with the chat. I am the chat. I love the Because that's yeah. what I, you know, usually I would do and I just kind of type away. I don't even know how, I don't even know how all this stuff started, but. We're like Ben and Jerry's, but you're not dirty hippies in Vermont. I, I, I'm, I'm much more <laughs> like Ben and Jerry's than I, than I am like uh, Nate and, and, and Eric. <laughs> uh, so what 
on Earth is Stephen N. Gosney, <laughs> author of Ideas and Answers in Law with forward by Andrew Branca and blurb on the back by Nick Ricada. Doing on my chat, you may ask, well, other than shilling for his book at primelaw.net. Order it now. <laughs> um, if you watch the trial we did of Matthew Terry last week, we, we were we were into our cups, as they say, and oh, yes. <laughs> he made a suggestion about, yes, a, about a wine, a tawny port wine. Uh, unfortunately for my liver and my pocketbook, I happen to have a very, very nice bottle shop right across the street from my, my office. <laughs> uh, so lunchtime, I just popped over in there to see what their, see what their weekly, uh, whiskey sale was. And I saw a bottle of the, of the bottle of the bottle of the uh, Tawny Port wine that Steve recommended Taylor's 10 yes. year. It's the Taylor's Flatgate. Which, interestingly enough, they're going to have to change their packaging. Oh, why is that? Because they they are they had the queen's designation on here. Oh, hmm. about the, that. By, by appointment of her of her of her Majesty Queen Elizabeth II, suppliers of port wine, Taylor's Port Portugal. When she dies, these become null and void. So <laughs> they're going to have to take these. They'll off. have to discount it. Yeah, uh, not, <laughs> not bloody likely. Actually, the yeah. tenure is actually kind of my go-to port. I have a twenty because it's about twice the price, and it's yeah. marginally better. I would say um, it's it's good. It's different. It's more rich and deep, and a little more husky and and oaky. I would say, like from the barrel. But um, and so I I think you know. So I break that out. Especially I am a poor public mm. defender, you know. So. <laughs> So now, I can just, only just so people get the idea of prices. What does this 10 year Tawny port set you back in Florida? About 40. So it, uh, it's about 70 bucks here, okay. which is actually pretty cheap because whiskey has 162% tax on it. Okay. And then 20 and then the 20 year is about 70 to 80. Um, so it's about oh, twice. I wish I, I wish I could get a 20 year port for $70 here. Uh, the Graham's Tawny port is about a hundred dollars here. Well, that's a 30 I, year I, one. I mean, if you want to give a second, I could join you. If if you are so inclined, I will just talk a little bit about this. Okay, and a thirty-year tawny go port too. Okay, one sec. And a thirty-year tawny point for part port from Taylor's that was about three hundred dollars. And uh, although I wouldn't really flinch too much of spending three hundred dollars on a good bottle of whiskey, there's no way in hell I'm spending three hundred dollars on a bottle of wine, even if it is a twenty percent. I'm assuming this is twenty percent. Yep, twenty percent because it's a fortified wine. I'm not spending $300 on a bottle of wine. <laughs> I'm much too cheap for that. Uh, see, Graham, Uxlow is saying Gra Graham's Tawny 10 or 40-year-old. Holy crap, that would be good. Or 1975's Graham Vintage. Graham's Tawny 10 is my go-to port. I've got about three bottles of it over on the shelf back there. So that's why I was excited to try this, because I want to see how Graham's Tawny compares to the uh, Taylor's Tawny. There you go. See? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Well, very close. This is I have my official what, this is Taylor port. Flatgate. It should be the same, but yep, it's the same one. This is Taylor Flatgate. Um, hmm. hmm. We'll see how it compares. So I told Steve that if I I, I got it and if he was available, and I, that's why I was laughing because I literally said I was just looking through my email right before I got on stream, and I saw we were trying to work out a time to do this, but he's going to be busy from about an hour from now forever until next vacation. <laughs> So actually, so I said, oh my I'm, God, got, I didn't I'm, see this. Today so is my I, I last day off, so I'm, yeah. but I've got two interviews today, like later. I'm trying to do some rumble stuff because <laughs> I might actually make another quarter. Cheers, my friend. Cheers, sir. Let's do a little yeah. something. So I, I send them the email and said, oh my gosh, I just saw this. I'm so sorry. I'll, I'm going to do it live in like 10 minutes. If you're available in 10 minutes, uh, pop on. I'm so sorry. And then he was here like two minutes later. So, well, <laughs> so I was, that's why I was like laughing. at my computer workstation here. So. Uh, well, and I don't have goes. anything to add on your maritime law. So I'm going to, I was going to watch it anyway, because I enjoy your maritime sessions and I learn it's fascinating what you do. So this, this, this isn't going to make your morning very happy, but this is, this is not a feel good story. This will. But, yeah. <laughs> well, cheers, sir. Let's see. Let's see. As, as I told him earlier today, I'm putting my money where his mouth is. Mm. I like that. Oh, yes, it kind of unfolds. Oh, yeah, the finish is crazy good. Ooh, and it's warm, too. <laughs> I know it does. It warms you up. It's got a, it's like a very complex. It's got a little more of an alcoholic 
taste to it. I mean, it's not a burn at all. There's, there's, there's not an alcoholic burn. It's only 20%. It's got a little more of an alcohol flavor to it than Graham's, but that, that's what the warming up feeling is. It's a, it's, it's like you're being, you're being hugged by a bottle of alcohol. Right. <laughs> uh, but boy, the, I mean, it's just, what, what's that first initial taste? Almost like cherries. It's like a very oaky cherry flavor. And then like the thing I like about Tawny Port is that raisin flavor that just kind of explodes at the end. And this yeah. tastes really, really raisiny. It's like liquid raisins in a glass. Ugh. I like it because it's got um, the, the 20 has a little more, like I said, a little more barrel flavor. Um, but I like it because it's 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 sweet. And I, I usually like one or two glasses are all I do because this is actually quite high alcohol content. Yes, yeah, 20%. 20%. So it's not like wine. I mean, it is, it's a and it's great with steak. Oh my god! Oh yeah, that would be fantastic with steak. If you're a cigar smoker, it's a cigar drink. I've I've got my pipe loaded up here for for later. Uh, now, would it work for a, with a pipe? I'm sure it would. Okay. The the this this is my favorite tobacco that I'm using for when I when I usually uh, drink my tawny ports. But wow, this is really good. I mean, I I said they have the thirty year bottle for about three hundred dollars, and there's no way I'm going to spend three hundred dollars on a bottle of wine. Uh, right, <laughs> but if no, the twenty year comes in stock. I, we're I not Ricada territory. We're uh, yeah, we're sluggers here on the. Uh, but we got twenty. We got the ten year old, which is not so bad, is it? And I'm thinking this bottle's not going to last very long. <laughs> well, I hear that you're eighty percent liver, so yeah <laughs> i definitely don't have that endurance i'm a girly drinker although I, I gotta say see the key is marry somebody who's a light more of a lightweight than you are yes <laughs> my wife she drinks like one sip and she has she's like i gotta go to the hospital <laughs> <laughs> like oh darn what a shame let me have another one <laughs> right right <laughs> well anyway i don't oh, want to wow. intrude on your beautiful show i i actually i was just gonna watch and then you sent me the link i'm like well if he's gonna try the port um, yeah. So I'll I'll join with you, but I want to shut up and watch because I'm really I'm blown. I love this maritime stuff; is very cool. Well, and, and and for those of you that aren't appreciating the fullness of what just happened, he just had a glass of wine at eight fifteen a.m. Yes, this never <laughs> happens. I can't say I've ever drank before noon, but I'm doing it because I got to go back to work tomorrow. <laughs> I got to <laughs> drink while you can. My last day. I'm celebrating it with my buddy Legal Vices. <laughs> Oh, uh, I deeply appreciate it. And thank you so much for the recommendation. I was surprised because they didn't usually have this. This is I've never seen this before until you just mentioned it. Good. Well, you know, that's the thing. I mean, like, it's like music. I do a lot of music on my channel. And people are like, Gazi, why are you doing music? We like your legal commentary. I'm like, you know <laughs> what? That's boring. I, I want to talk music. And if you can share like a good band that you've heard or a yeah. good, you know, bit of music, then I mean, I, that's that's the gift. You know, it's like part of what friends do. So. Same thing with like my favorite alcohol vintages. <laughs> well, I, I got it. I got some more homework for you. And email me. Let you know what you think. Uh, a, a a new band that I'm currently fixated on at the moment. Oh yeah, you're a metalhead too. See, you know, like you know, you, do you do you like Ginger? Oh, Ginger's my favorite band okay. right now. It's my top. So you, very very gingery vibes. They're they're from Portland, Oregon. They. Uh, they they they're their own genre. They're sort of folk, uh, country metal <laughs> rock. Uh, I, I mean, the, you know, the 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 lead singer she plays a, a national resonator ukulele. Uh, it's just it's fantastic. They're called Bridge City Sinners. Bridge City Sinners. Let me write that. Yeah, the down. Bridge City Sinners, and I would recommend starting with the song Unholy Hymns and just deep diving from there. Unholy Hymns. Okay. Because I've got, um, yeah, I'm going to go see Ginger in December, Orlando. I'll see you in the mosh pit. Oh, yeah, lucky bastard. Yes. Yeah, so <laughs> I'd be, be the fun. second time. First time I saw him, I, I'm getting old. <laughs> My mosh pits are a little harder for me now. But I saw, so we, <laughs> we were up in the balcony. And then I wanted to be in the pit so bad, man. That was like, at best shows. That's like, it's right now, Ginger's like my favorite band. Um. So they're just great. Everything they do, you know, the, if you want to see a great show, I, I alive in Melbourne when they're alive mm. in Melbourne. And I, oh, I remember the moment it's interesting that band, the moment I began to really love them. Was it a band, a song called I speak astronomy alive in Melbourne, mm. Australia. 
And I, I was watching the concert because sometimes you see them live, you see a live video and it's like you tune into them. And when they did that song and she hits that high note, you know what I'm talking about? When she goes yeah. up, like they take that big pause yeah. and then she belts it. I mean, I was like, I was like, I am sold. I, I clicked. I mean, I, it was like the moment that they became my favorite band right now, you know? Uh, we've confused the chat. Ginger is from Ukraine. Bridge City Sinners is from Portland, Oregon. Okay. Don't confuse the chat. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah, the, 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 the song uh, Unholy Hymns is a great song. Yes, it's Ginger with a J. It's J I N J E R. Yeah. They're and yeah, they're a Ukrainian metal band, kind of a gent with a phenomenal singer. Every, the whole band is just really good. And, and very what, what, would you, what, what song would you recommend starting Ginger with? Well, you know, everybody goes with Pisces. Yeah, well, if, I mean, I, yeah. If yeah. you've never heard them before, then you can start Pisces, with Pisces yeah. because yeah. it's that dramatic unfolding. Yeah. But it depends, like, if, if you want, if you're, like, not into metal so much, if you are, like, a little bit softer, you're not ready for the hardcore stuff, I would recommend Wallflowers, which is off their latest mm. album. It's a mellow, it's a song about introverts. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I love it because, actually, I'm an introvert. It's amazing. People don't believe it, but I am. And um, so if you want that, but if you want, like, if you're into really heavy stuff, then the, the song, probably Vortex. Vortex is fantastic. Which is, it's like them on, on in fifth gear going like 80 mile an hour down the highway. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's rip your face off. It's a, and of course, one of my favorite songs, aside from I Speak Astronomy, especially the live off live of Melbourne is a uh, home back, which talks about the Ukraine war. Mm. Oh, it's, it's, I, you know, it's amazing. I've never been moved by a metal song in the yeah. way that song is. I, I remember they did this alive. I think it was at Bloodstock or something like that. And they did Homeback. And it was actually quite emotional and powerful. Now it's a heavy, heavy, uh, but that's a great song. I, I like everything they do, but I, I would go with those, uh, you know, uh, those. So if, you, if you're sort of a metal head, but not a gent head, go with Homeback. All right. Well, that, that's our musical recommendations for the day. Ginger and uh, Bridge City Sinners. And cheers, Steve. Thank you so much for the recommendation. All right. Well, I'll I'll, I'll go back because some people say I talk too much. You know, I was on your see. So you, you know, this is an interesting observation: is that people say uh, your negative comments are like ten times as powerful as positive comments. Yeah. yeah. And you know. I, you get uh, everybody. I mean, people are so nice in the chat and they're nice to me and everything. And I'm like, oh, I feel warm and fuzzy. And then somebody says, God, he needs to shut up. He talks too much. He thinks he knows it all. And I'm like fixated. <laughs> yeah. oh, newsflash. He does know it all. Well, you should see, you should see the stuff he sends in the private chats. You ask one simple question, you get like 40 pages of really in-depth knowledge. That's fascinating. That's why I had him on. He clearly knows more about what he's talking about than I do. So, well, I know in criminal law, especially in Florida, that's my wheelhouse, right? So I yeah. better damn well know it. But when it comes it's to my, marriage my... law, I'm going to be drooling on myself, going, "I know nothing." <laughs> it, as as my uh, philosophy, I was a philosophy major. As my as my uh, department head and mentor told me when he tagged me to be a TA and teach a few of the classes, he said, study from the best books and teach from the second best books. <laughs> oh, yeah, clever. <laughs> then you seem really smart, right? Yeah, yeah, yep, yeah. that's what. So I, I have the best guests and I talk in the second guy's seat. But, well, thank you so much for this wine recommendation, Steve. And uh, let me know what you think of Bridge City Sinners. I'm curious. I will. I will. Well, do you want me to log off and you do your maritime show? Oh, it's up to it's up to whatever you want. I mean, you can hang out here in the background and make any comments if you're so inclined. Uh, hey, man, we can watch a, a documentary. There's a chatter called Maiden Iron. Yes, Maiden Iron's a good, she likes good, me. good person. Yeah, so thank you, Maiden Iron. <laughs> up the irons, man. Well, it's entirely up to you. You can, you can hang around and watch the documentary with us, or you can well, go I'll, about I'll, your I'll go ahead and, and mute myself and let. But I'll, I'll 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 hang out and watch. But I'll try to remain as silent as possible because <laughs> I'm here to learn. Along with, I'll be the All chat right. representative. How's that? That's <laughs> that sounds good. You can represent the chat. All right. Well, with that, let's get uh, let's get into this here. Those of you that are wondering what the hell just happened. Uh, <laughs> It's Maritime Monday, don't worry, but we had to talk about a wine last week. Steve recommended Steve M. Gosney at CrimeLaw.net. Uh, Steve N. Gosney, sorry, I said M, I think. Uh, but 
go to his site, check him out. He's got a great book for sale. Uh, he recommended this wine and I thought, and I like Tawny Port wine. So I thought I would give it a crack. Uh, it happened to be at the local bottle shop. So I told him I would test it here with him and I'd tell him what I think. And that's how we got here. But now it's time to get back onto Maritime Monday this week. Again, as I said, this is not a feel good story. This is the Penley lifeboat disaster, uh, from 1981. So this is a fairly recent incident in the, in the world of maritime accidents. Uh, and any story that starts with the title disaster, you know, is not going to be the feel good story of the day. Uh, but well, let's, let's just kind of watch it. This is another documentary, sort of like the Shackleton one we watched last week. Uh, it was about an hour long. So the way I talk, it'll probably be about two hours, two hours and 20 minutes before we, before we finish our hour long documentary. Uh, all the standard rules apply. Thank you so much mods for being here, for doing your mod jobs. Couldn't do it without you. Uh, those of you here in chat, thank you for being part of the chat. Keep it going. And those of you that are just listening to this as you go about your day, as you're driving around the country, around the world, as you're at your office, whatever you are, just listen to it in the background. Thank you so much. That's why that's kind of how I want to do these things, a visual as well as audio. So you can just have it on in the background like radio when you go about your day. But I would appreciate it if you come back later and hit that like button at some point. Maybe leave a little comment. And those of you that are here now and active, we have 378 concurrent viewers and only 177 likes. A little over halfway, according to my really horrible math. It's I know it's not half yet, but close enough. But <laughs> hit that like button. That's what YouTube likes. YouTube likes the likes. It's To paraphrase Frank Burns, who said it's nice to be nice to the nice. I like to like the likes, so like. Uh, thank you so much for that. Hit that like button. Let's get the numbers up to, we, we should be up to three. There's no reason we're not at 378 likes. You're here. You've been here more than 30 seconds. Hit it. And subscribe if you're so inclined. Uh, YouTube or Conscious people deleted about uh, 20 subscriptions overnight for some weird reason. I'm a lovable guy, so get those numbers back up. Hit the like button, hit the subscribe button, and come back later. And now with that, let's jump into this as we clear off the first Super Chats of the day. Xcomer, have you yet? Yeah, we, we thought about that, but uh, we're doing our thing. Steve's a busy, busy man, and we'll, we'll get together as time permits. Professor Pelican said, holy excrement, I'm an ex-fisherman from Cornwall. I went past the Penley Lifeboat House every morning. Well, that's what we're talking about today. Um, you know, bless you guys in that neighborhood, man. That's a, it's a rough story. Looks like we did this. Graham's Tawny 10 or 40 for me or 19. I haven't had the 1975 Graham's Vintage or the 40 year. I've had the 20 year and the 10 year. Uh, clear that out. Flux. Hey, Flux. Welcome. Pants are prison. It's too cold for non-pants now. Sad. I'm still definitely well into non-pants category and territory, so we're still doing good. Just to... non-pants. <laughs> yeah, pants are prison. Hey, let me I'm ask just... you. Since since yeah. you you took my advice, what Graham's port should I try to return the favor? Uh, well, the the ten years might go to. If, ten if year, you can, ten year Graham's. If you're feeling that the Tawny port 20 years priced right enough for you. I would recommend that, but the 10 is my go-to Tawny port. Graham's uh, Tawny port. Yeah. Okay. Yep. And Uxla can't believe it is so much where you are. Graham's 40 is only 50 pounds here. 10 is 14 pounds. Wow. That'd be nice. Uh, Graham's Graham's 10 here is about $60. So a little, 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 little less expensive than this. I was going to say cheap, but neither one of them are cheap. <laughs> but you get used to it. Uh, it's, it's, that's why I love going to the States and just like, you want a glass of whiskey? Let me buy you that whole bottle. It's about the same price as a cocktail in, in, in Korea. And we've got two more Super Chats, then we're going to jump into it. Steve C., thank you so much. I can't stay long. I Also, I have to work. Also, Steve, let's start drinking at 8 a.m. <laughs> it's the last chance to do it. <laughs> I, I'm a bad influence. Uh, Stingy says, Gauz wants more guitar nights from Friday. Apologize to AO on stream on Sunday. Seemed like he hated being reminded of it. Is that for I me? I don't know what that means. I guess. Let's see, Gauz, that's me. Yeah, wants more guitar nights. Guitar from nights. Friday. Apologize to AO. Who's AO? I don't know. Were you on stream on Sunday? I don't know. Seemed like he Did hated somebody being remind reminded of it? of it. Reminded of what? Apologizing to AO on Sorry, screen? Stingy. I don't thank you, Stingy, for that really cryptic message. <laughs> All right. Now, get your laughs and giggles out now because uh, from here on out, it gets dark. Uh, the guitar night video with the pan. Oh, oh, the uh, the Metallica with the with the night where she was hitting him over the head with the frying pan. Oh, right. So what was the chat again? Okay, I remember that. Oh, I gotta go back and find it. Sorry, yeah. I'm so clueless. Uh, me too. I just resigned it to the 
to the incomprehensible things here. Okay. Uh, well, God good. wants more guitar nights from Friday. Okay, now that makes sense. Apologize to AO on stream on Sunday. Aussie Overlord. Ah, okay. Seemed like he hated being reminded of it. No, I, I have, hmm. I have no opinion. I didn't. I thought it was kind of funny, and <laughs> I don't know. I, I, I didn't. I didn't have any emotional reaction like it's being implied here. So, thanks for the super chat, Sinji. But I, 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 I don't know. You think you're projecting? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, we figured out it was Aussie Overlord and not AOC. AOC is a big booty Latina. <laughs> we didn't confuse AO with AOC. All right. <clears throat> Here we go. Time to cut down the levity. We'll make inappropriate comments and, and jokes as much as we can during this whole thing, but it's time to get into disaster territory as we do on Maritime Monday. Next Monday, I promise something that'll be a lot less dark than this. I haven't figured out what it is. I got a couple things in mind, but I'm guaranteed it's not going to be, I can't do so many dark stories in a week, but wait for two weeks from now. We hit really, really, really dark stories in two weeks. Uh, <laughs> sorry about that guys. Something to look forward to. And here we go. This is from BBC four digital factual channel of the year. Uh, this is 1981. So a lot of the people that are involved are well and truly still alive because I remember 1981 <laughs> quite vividly. <laughs> so this isn't ancient history. These people are still around and let's go. Tell me how the volume is. Don't we need to turn out the court, the court volume. I'm sorry. It must be, it seems like I've been streaming court proceedings for the last two weeks. If I need to turn up the video volume, please let me know. Uh, super chats aren't required. There, there's no minimum. There's no, none of that. But if you do the super chats, you're guaranteed to get your comments read. Otherwise we'll try to uh, keep track of the chats as best we can. Let's go. Land's in Coast Guard, loaded. Land's in Coast Guard. Union Star, Union Star, going land's in Coast Guard. Yes, this starts on board the Union Star, a vessel in distress. Yes, we are. Uh, approximately now, eight miles east of Wolf Rock. No subtitles, uh, sorry. engines have stopped, and we are unable to get them started at the moment. And if you're out in the middle of the ocean, and your engine stops, and you can't get it started in the middle of a storm, that's like the least best desirable situation you could possibly imagine. You're just totally at the mercy of the wind and the waves at that point. 25 years ago. Oh, and one more thing. The rule, the rules of Maritime Monday, those of you in the chat that know the story, no spoilers, let the story unfold naturally for those that aren't familiar with it. Cargo ship called the Union Star suffered engine failure off the coast of Cornwall. In hurricane winds and 60-foot waves, the Penley lifeboat set forth to try and rescue the ship's crew. Eight men, all volunteers, made the ultimate sacrifice in one of the greatest disasters in lifeboat history. I look back on it and I see those men on the rails and the efforts they did in the rocks. and You, you can't imagine the, the bravery of people like that. Despite the fact it's 25 years, you know, she went out and she's still out. And there's that gap in, in people's lives and, and feelings that I think will never go away while the people alive who, who experienced it. You know, I used to long as a journalist that I would get a world exclusive. I got my wish, but it broke my heart. Mm. In the far south of Cornwall, just a few miles from Land's End, lies a place called Mausel. The events that happened here 25 years ago changed this small village forever, scarring the lives of those left behind. In 1981, Mausel was a close-knit fishing community, at the heart of which was the Penley lifeboat.
And that's how you launch lifeboats from shore. They just p- jump on and then they shoot you from the from the lighthouse. I mean, the lighthouse, the lifeboat launching pad. They just shoot you down and then you start the engines and you take off to wherever you need to go to rescue. Based a mile from Mausel off Penley Point, she was called the Solomon Brown. And she was the pride and joy of the village. The Solomon Brown was a, a wooden Watson class lifeboat. Uh, we were quite pleased with her because she'd been recently refitted and we thought that she was the state of the art boat. Um, but it was a class of boat that was stationed all around the country. When I was growing up, the lifeboat was a big part of the village. Mauser was just starting to become a tourist village. It's more, there's, you know, more locals living here. And it's just something you always wanted to do. I always wanted to be in the lifeboat. Because I remember I used to run it when I was a child and help them scrub it down and things like that. I think it's cool that there's like this little lifeboat that's sort of the pride of the town. Most of the crew were born and bred in Mauser. Many of them were fishermen. And they were all devoted volunteers. They were led by the coxswain, Trevelyan Richards. You're still getting the family element in lifeboat crews, fathers, sons and grandsons and that sort of thing? Yes, yes. We've got one or two of them here in our present crew. Where do they come from in the main? What sort of profession are they? Well, they're mostly fishermen and they come to the same village. So when they say lifeboat in English, they're talking about, they're talking about um, basically like what we would consider a Coast Guard vessel, right? So this isn't a lifeboat that gets shot off the ship. It's it's a rescue vessel from the shore. Yeah, okay. yeah it's 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 a, it's a land based lifeboat. British man, they they got a different word for everything. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, it's, it's the same effect. They're basically the same, and they look very very similar to each other. Uh, but this is sort of a powered uh, land based lifeboat, where I guess it's sort of like the local volunteer fire department. These guys are volunteer. They get the uh, rescue alert. They jump on the boat and they shoot out and they they go to try to rescue whoever's there. Uh, if they're not fishermen, they have connections with the sea. So I'm, I'm pretty lucky in a way here. And if you need me to, like to boost up the video volume, please let me know. Trevelyan was a good coxswain. He was a character in his way and uh, sat in his ways. Uh, a fisherman all his life. So I think we ought to establish, right, although you are the coxswain, you've got a full-time job as a trawler skipper, haven't That's you? That's right, yes. Uh, this is just a part-time job. I think he was in the armed guard when the war was on, but uh, as a coxswain, he was an extremely nice man. I think in every community, you always get a nucleus of people. They all stand above the rest in what they do because they they can take any flack from anyone and they don't really care, you know, and they'll always march on to what they think is true. Um, I think Trevelyan's up in the top notch with them. Nobody would contradict him, you know, he, he was the boss. He was a hell of a character as well, you know, he could be quite hard on them or he could be really, you know, I mean, they, they could be pretty wild at times. They knew how to have fun. On the night of the 19th of December, 1981, Mausel was all set for Christmas. The village had a unique way of marking the festive season. Christmas is a big thing in Mausel and we have the local Christmas lights on every year and it is a big celebration. We have a, a, a thing called Tom Bocox Eve, which is a, the day before Christmas Eve. So it's the 23rd of December when all the local fishermen and seamen get together mm. and have a, well, like a great big party, if you like, really. It's, it's good and it's it is a big thing in Mosul. So, yeah, the, again, this also happens Everybody at Christmas time. So that adds to the drinking, the horror laughing, of it. joking. This is kind of the Dark, emotional setup, started, though. You know, they, they set you up for the fall. For Everyone was laughing and saying, cool, how'd you come to pick me out against so-and-so? That's the most Sea Captain Maritime looking guy that's not Popeye that I've ever seen in my life. <laughs> I, f- I feel unworthy to wear this hat next to him. I don't know. You can, you're close. You're very close. If this Only Popeye is more Maritime looking guy than this guy. This guy's awesome. I love him already. Yeah. So like, you know... <laughs> Whilst people were enjoying themselves, outside, the weather was gradually deteriorating. It had gone from a high wind to this extraordinarily screaming wild gale in a very, very short time. 
um, it had a, a, a sort of strange note in the wind, and I'm not making this up, it really did. It was, it was a screaming sort of noise, which I've never heard of. Mm. As the weather worsened, out at sea, the Union Star was struggling with engine failure. Mm. And that's just that's just a ship that runs up and down the coast, just sort of like you know, like a little ferry boat type situation. And there's like I said, there's eight people on it. It's out in the middle. And eight miles doesn't sound like that far. I mean, you, you can drive your car eight miles, but you know, you've got seas like this, no engines, and you're eight miles from anything. At that point, you can't even see land. On a clear day, you'd probably be able to see land from about seven miles. So these guys are in 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 the middle of the night. No engines in this storm, calling for help. They've got eight people on board they need to rescue. On duty that night to receive the calls was Colin Sturman. Well, the Union Star told us um, just after six o'clock that he had an engine problem, which in itself is not unusual. We have ships call us with engine problems uh, several times a week, even today. Um, but he said that uh, obviously the weather conditions were bad and he was concerned that if uh, he couldn't get his engine started that they would be in difficulty. Our intentions are at the moment, we want to get the main engine started, but if we cannot get the main engine started, we'll have to take everybody off and get a tug or someone to tow us in. And I mean, just, just to let you know the time, there, the, uh, the wreck of the Edmund Fitzgerald I did the deep dive on that four months ago. So if you want to watch that, go back and watch it. But as, as I said at that time, I'm, I'm a big baby. The song, the wreck of the Edmund Fitzgerald. That's one of the four songs that just inevitably makes me cry. It's just, it's just a, a terrible, sad song. And you know, when you watch that video, when you watch you know, the deep dive, I did, there's the line in the wreck of the Edmund Fitzgerald that really hits hard. It says, does anyone know where the love of God goes when you know the, the minutes turn into hours, you know, just just minutes seem like hours. It seems like eternities in these situations. The Union Star was on her maiden voyage, carrying fertilizer from Holland to Ireland. It was one of a fleet of of coasters um, built by Union Transport who were having a very successful time. It was a good model because it was fit for. Well, I guess I guess I should say the. the I mean, the actual quote: <laughs> "Does anyone know where the love of God goes when the waves turn the minutes to hours?" And that's what's happening for these people on this on this ship. I mean, just minutes. Every minute must just seem like an eternity. It just must seem like hours. Work in coastal waters. It was very low profile, and so it could go up under the bridges of the, the big rivers in Europe. And uh, they built four of them, actually, for about a million pounds apiece. The Union Star was, was the latest one. The skipper of this brand new boat was Henry Morton. Happy go lucky type of guy. Um, very professional and uh, straight down the line, really. He didn't take any messing off anybody. And um, he was, I don't know, um, a pleasant enough guy, really, I suppose. I spoke to him in the morning about 10 o'clock and um, he said everything was going all right. And I asked him, wouldn't he be around the corner? We, we, we called Land's End the corner. He said about uh, just after tea. And um, then he'd be running away with the weather towards Aqua and he seemed quite happy. And I asked him what the weather was like and they told me that it was suddenly about force five, but it was forecast to deteriorate during the day. And he told me that the ship was handling it quite well. It was rolling a bit. Now, I don't want to be critical of him, but I have to be critical of him. I don't want to be, but in in situations like this, there's always something you can look at. There's always something you can point to that if it had only been done differently, this wouldn't happen. Well, and also uh, what you find yeah. also in these kind of disaster situations that we deal with in hurricanes in Florida is that it's not the single failure. It's a cascading failure. So what happens is, okay, your power goes out and then you've got the mm -hmm. storm and then you might... You might get a, a a leak 
and then the bilge isn't working. And then you have like, you know, so you have sort of a, a cascading failure that you don't expect. It's like you've expected maybe one or two concentric circles around the particular failure, but you don't expect the additional ones. And that's oftentimes what leads to these kind of disasters. And I, and I think here the the primary cause was this is this ship's maiden voyage. Now, when you when you order a ship, whether it's a small boat like that or a giant, you know, two hundred and fifty thousand ton oil carrier, your crude oil carrier, they'll do a sea, they'll do sea trials, which is basically they run through all the basic safety checks of the vessel, and they'll, they'll sign off and check to make sure everything is operating within parameters. But you never know what a ship is going to do on its maiden voyage. You, you, you never know if something's going to short out, if there's going to be. You know, if there's going to be a power failure, if there's going to be something wrong with the engine, if you know, something wasn't oiled properly, anything can go wrong on that maiden voyage. You just have to trust and hope. And to take a small craft like that out on a maiden voyage when you know the weather is scheduled to be deteriorating through the day is unfortunately not a wise choice. You, This is something you would want to do on a calm day. I get that, hey, this is my new boat. I get it today and I want to take it out. I get that. But Mother Nature does not care about you or your boat. You've got to respect Mother Nature. And Baloney Bong is a new member. Thank you, Baloney Bong. I thought you were already a member. Did you just re-up? But if not, hey, welcome aboard. I thought you were already a member. Hmm. And one quick thing here. Omni Stash Gaming. Hey, all legal vices. What kind of vices should I partake, partake in for my birthday, which may or may not be today? If you if you enjoy spirits, have a have a shot of the best whiskey you can possibly afford. If you're a cigar smoker, enjoy the best possible cigar you can afford. If you just like cake, get the best, biggest, most delicious cake. It's your birthday. Enjoy it. Do whatever your particular vice is. And happy birthday. Interesting. Your birthday today. It's my my brother's birthday on the 19th and my son's on the 18th and my mother's on the 15th. I hate this time of year. Cuz I mean my mother she's she's deceased now, but her birthday's the 15th, my son is the 18th, my brother's the 19th, my sister's is December 16th, and then I have to buy presents for everybody all over again on Christmas. So <laughs> I just sort of kiss my money goodbye from November. And but happy of, birthday to you. Speaking of maiden voyages, how about maidens uh how about iron maiden and uh you know what is it um what is it what's the epic song about the ship and the, the the water and the um the albatross you know what is that everybody knows that song you know the song iron maiden um come on chat oh i can't believe my brain is losing it go by plane rhyme of the ancient mariner thank you roy ah. I just could, I suddenly couldn't get sailing out of my head. <laughs> you said that. Uh, all right, let's let's get back to the maiden voice. I mean, see if if ah if there was any problems with the engine, if there was any engine failure that was going to happen, and we don't know, maybe the engine failure happened because of the water getting into the engine through the. As Steve was saying, a leak somewhere, a bad seal. This is stuff you just can't know until you. You, you break the ship in it. It's like you buy a car, you buy a motorcycle, anything. You break it in gently. You break it in a little bit at a time to make sure you don't get yourself in a disastrous situation like this. But by early evening, the situation was very different. Yeah, we're just slowly drifting in towards the land at the moment. We're trying to start the engine, and uh, if we get it underway, and we get clear, uh, we'll let it know. Thank you very much. Worried how far the Union Star might be drifting, the Coast Guard sent one of their local officers to a lookout point, just along the coast from Mausel. I got a call from Falmouth to say that uh, there's a vessel in trouble near the wolf, and would I start the radar up and put a radar plot on to positively identify the position. By the time I got up here and, and put a, a marker on him on the radar, he drifted some to the north. 
Okay, now the the radar what you know, at the Coast Guard station here and on on vessels they they have a a radar system where you you'll see a ship on a radar and you can you can pinpoint you can target it and it'll stay targeted so you can watch the movement of that vessel on the radar and you, so you're just plotting the track of that particular thing now now the the things are so well advanced that you can target literally dozens of vessels at the same time. So that's what he's talking about when he's, he's saying you can just place a marker on it on the radar and then you can track its movements. So here they're checking, they're tracking how much it's drifting as a result of the winds and they're finding it's drifting really quickly and really far. The Union Star was heading straight towards the treacherous coastline. Uh. If you come ashore on this coast, you've got very little chance of getting off and you break up quite quickly. You imagine a yacht coming ashore on any of these points uh, in even weather like this, and it'll go down very quickly. In Mausel, the Penley lifeboat was put on standby. Two of the crew members waiting for the call were Nigel Brockman and his son, Neil. My dad was a second or assistant mechanic, he was known as then, and he would have been in charge of the, the radios and the radar and do a bit of navigating and stuff like that. What kind of equipment do you carry, Nigel? Well, we've got radar, the master set, which is Woodson Clipper, and the Westminster VHF. What range? What's your range? Uh, most people knew my father. He could never be serious about anything. He was always joking around. He was like the the joker in the pack. If anything stupid was happening, he'd be in the middle doing it, you know. So, and I, well, I know I've never heard anyone say a bad word about him. Never. Everyone I, I've Chad, shut up. Spoke to or come up to, people I don't even know come up to me and said they knew my father, which I like. You know, and they say how much you know how much they admired him and liked him. This is England, after all. A salvage tug was contacted to tow the stricken Union Star. But this would involve paying salvage costs mm -hmm. as part of a contract called a Lloyd's Open Form. So Morton declined the offer. Oh, I've drafted so many of those. See, there's another mistake. You see, cascading mistakes, right? It's not just one. Maiden voyage, engine failure, decline the tow, just keeps, you know, it's not one. You can't yeah. say this one thing. It's a cascading failure, right? I'm just guessing. Yeah, yeah. I, I haven't. I don't know anything about this, but I'm yeah, foreseeing the, uh, the inevitable doom. And with the salvage companies, they don't really move until they have a contract in place determining how they're going to get paid because salvage operations can easily run into the millions of dollars. So this and. It, don't blame the tug. The tug is not the rescue boat. That's not their job to rescue people. Their job is to salvage the vessel, which is literally salvage it, to go in and just haul it in to port. That's its only job, not to, not to play rescue people. So I don't blame the tugboat for saying, yeah, sorry, we ain't doing this. Station calling Union Star. The Union Star, Falmouth Coast Guard, isn't it? Oh, Falmouth Coast Guard, yes, Union Star. Yes, I know you've had a word with the skipper of the uh, salvage tub, Nord Holland, haven't you? Yes, I had a word with him. All he's interested in is the money at the moment. When he, he was talking to the tug captain very early on, and the tug captain said, shall I come out? And he said, yes, come out and stand by. And so the tug captain said, well, will you accept Lloyd's open form? And he said, obviously, you know, it's a bit early to, to, to make a commitment to do that. <laughs> See, again, I mean, in retrospect, the, the, the tug operator probably felt like a bit of a dick for not uh, going out to help save the guy, but it wasn't a life or death situation at this point. And the, the newly minted boat owner is like saying, oh, I don't think I want to get into an open-ended uh, payment contract uh, right at this point because we're not in mortal danger. 
the, the Lloyd Dolphin Farm is just it's a salvage contract. It's a it's a contract between you and the person that's going to to salvage your vessel, which is just haul this useless hunk of steel or whatever back to shore. It's just a contract to do that. But you and you at this you point, said, you yeah. said I'm interested in this also. Don't let me stop you. But the, the other thing is that um, this is another common thing in these kind of cascading disasters is that people are not self aware enough to know when the Rubicon has been crossed, right? So yeah. it's like, well, I'm pretty close. You know, they, they don't expect the next failure. So it's like pilots that say, well, the, the storm's coming up, but I think I can make it. And then you commit yourself and you aren't quick enough. You know, it, it's it's always tough. It's like going to the, and calling the ambulance to the hospital. Well, I, you know, I think it's just a little stomach, a flare up. It's not really a heart attack, right? Yeah. And exactly. people don't want, they don't want to hassle people. They don't, they're thinking about the cost and all this. And so they, they don't act when they should. Right. Exactly. Very human, very human. Yeah. And, and uh, so they refused to tug back to shore. Wow. Well, they did because they didn't think it was worth the cost. It wasn't a life or death situation. It's one of these retrospect things. Like, yeah, I guess everybody probably wishes he would have just signed the damn paper and signed the contract to cover the costs of this salvage operation. Uh, the blame is on the salvage laws. No, not really. I think mean, it's, it's, you know, I mean, if they said this is not a salvage, this is a rescue, and they gave a mayday requiring all the vessels in the area to come and render assistance, then there would have been obligations to do that. But this is a salvage. It's it's just a. It's like if there was a wreck at the bottom of the sea, or if there was something that was washed ashore, and they want to do, they want, they said, okay, we're done. Come and just take it away. Just haul it, haul it away from where it is, haul it from point A to point B. But they hadn't got to that point yet, apparently. They didn't think it was a life or death situation. So they said, yeah, we're not going to we're not going to pay this cost. We're not going to contract for the tug to pull us in. And uh, at some point, I guess it became too late to do that. Let's find out. News that the lifeboat might be needed began to spread throughout Mausel. As soon as the minor keys start getting one played, of the youngest, yeah, you watch out. <laughs> was merchant seaman Kevin Smith, who happened to be home for Christmas. Love the sea. The sea was in his blood. He always, to me, seemed to be like a free spirit. He'd go off to sea. You never quite know when he was coming back, and he'd it's come in back. The minor and key, it was the saddest like of all keys. A breath of fresh air blowing through the village. D minor is the well, saddest Kevin of all keys. Kevin was my uh, brother-in-law. <laughs> Uh, at the time, lick my love. I sailed with Kevin many times when I was fishing. A great boat, a bit fun. Anything All right, this is my last class. Know. This is going down way uh, too easily. And there's a, bit of a massive zest for life. Zest for life, good Six song. Years earlier, the Solomon Brown had taken part in the rescue of a sinking ship called the Lovett. Kevin was a crew member, even though he'd only been a teenager at the time. Hey, you, I know, were on the Lovett rescue, weren't you? Yeah. And that was that was not very pleasant. No, that's, I was uh, seventy-five, I think. And you were very young. Yeah. In fact, I believe you were too young to have been there officially. So they told me so. Yeah. Kevin was very young, fifteen, sixteen. He'd actually fabricated his age to get on the boat at that point, <laughs> and went out on the Lovett rescue and was pulling men out of the sea that were younger than him, and he was awarded on vellum for that. Very, very brave thing to have done. You didn't, did you enjoy it? Well, you wouldn't enjoy it. It's a damn full question, but um, you'll remember it, I imagine. Oh, yeah, I always remember it, yeah. Very unpleasant. Yeah, I always remember it. The Penley crew had to pull several dead bodies out of the water. They were all honoured by the RNLI for their role in the rescue. Like the most of the crew, there wasn't a lot of speaking on board the boat. I think it was all sort of choked a bit with it, you know. But uh, I think what upset the crew most of all was when they took a youngster aboard, he was 16. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I'd admit it was a bad job. Every five men lose life of what we had. Oh, I guess that's when him when he was an illegally boy, young teenager. Nice stuff there to look at, no? He looks like Mary Pippin from the movies. It was a southerly wind gusting up to force 11, which is hurricane force. Even the broken waves, when they hit the cliff, 
was some 30 foot in, in height. And before anyone makes a turn it up to 11 joke for hurricanes, they, they have what's called a Beaufort scale. It's a, it measures like the wave heights and like the Beaufort one is essentially calm seas. And then it goes up to like a Beaufort nine, which is really, really bad. And then Beaufort 10 is just kind of the, the last you want to see. And then after that, 11 is a hurricane. So it's, it's, he's talking about a Beaufort scale. And it's named after apparently some dude named Beaufort. And it's just like, you know, is a one is waves of a certain height. Two goes up to waves of a swell. It was like swells. Then it goes to waves of a certain height, waves with white caps, uh, waves with rolling white caps. And then it goes up to hurricane force. So they, they turned it up to 11 and got up to hurricane force. Right. So I've never seen sea conditions as bad as that. And I've never seen them since. Both? A fusion? <laughs> That's the most 80s looking guy ever. Well, at the moment, we're trying to use our starboard tank, and we're hoping that one is okay. Could you give us a light on the helicopter, please? Yeah, just kind of seeing now. We should be able to launch shortly, Evan. Okay, thank you very much. We'll be able to launch shortly. With water in the fuel tank, it was now impossible to restart the engines of the Union Star, and a helicopter was needed. <laughs> the pilot who would no, communicate with Morgan scale. was Russell Smith, an American who was in England on a naval exchange program. When we first set off, it was only about 30, 40 knots of wind, maybe a little more. Not all that bad, really. Exactly. But as we proceeded to the scene, uh, the weather worsened significantly, very rapidly. And, uh, and we could tell this can be a full gale very shortly. Uh, yes, uh, you need to stop. Zero five minutes, huh? Zero five minutes, okay. Thank you very much. I'll have a hand flare uh, standing by for you. What was the movie with the big waves? Yeah. And the helicopter rescue? The dead storm, what is that called? What was that name? That Initially, the position was given as eight miles. The, the perfect storm? Perfect storm. Actually, I have yeah. a, fr a friend of mine was a, a helicopter pilot who was involved in that, the actual incident. Oh, wow, yeah. Yeah, his, uh, it's actually one of my closest friend's brother-in-law, and I've talked to him hmm. multiple times about it. He says the waves were so high during that incident that they were over the helicopter blades at the peaks. Yeah. He had to dip down into the troughs. <laughs> it's like that is that takes a certain amount of balls, God. right? Those, those Coast Guard rescue he pilots, rescue helicopter pilots have just got gigantic balls. And he right. was actually in the movie as an advisor, and he was oh, actually cool. made some appearance in the movie, but he was one of the advisors to that movie uh, when they were making it because he was in the incident, actually. Actual <laughs> one of the helicopters. Pie. <laughs> or no, the it wasn't Life of Pi. It was, it was no. <laughs> the perfect storm, I guess. Uh, wow. Yeah, that th th those guys are, are crazy. I try to get him. I actually, he'd be a great guest for you. Oh yeah, if you could, if you could kind of arrange that, that would be more than awesome. I'll, I'll see. I don't know. He's. I, I've tried to get him. He's. He's kind of flighty. <laughs> <laughs> All right. All right. Well, let's jump back into this. I was east of Wolf Rock, which put her about six miles south of um, Tatadu Light. Uh, when we identified uh, the correct position uh, with the helicopter from the flare. She was only about two, two and a half miles off the coast, which um, made things um, significantly different from a response point of view. With the Union Star so close to shore, the Penley lifeboat was asked to launch. So they've got to keep it away from the rocks. The launch crew that night were Dudley Penrose and Raymond Pomeroy. It was their job to launch the lifeboat safely. Don't seem like 25 years ago. No, no, no. no brave men. Brave men. I know that. You know, the one A lot of people wouldn't have gone that night, I know. <laughs> well, the first I knew that the lifeboat was wanted, I knew it was a terrible night. 
we all knew that it was a terrible day in the making. Uh, the first I heard of it was the coxswain's wife, Trevelyan's mother, Trevelyan's mother phoned me to say that the boat was wounded. And that was about 10 to 8 in that evening. When the maroons were heard, all the crew stopped what they were doing and rushed to the lifeboat station. One of those was 33-year-old Barry Tory, a fisherman who was married with two young sons. Mm. Barry was just a crew member. Uh, he'd been on there a long, long time. Um, not sure how old he was when he first went, um, but just a teenager, I think. See, they're volunteers. Um, they don't get paid to put their life on the line like life, this. Part of they do it for their brothers and fellow sailors. At sea. We'd planned to go out and we had a babysitter organized. Then the shout went out that they were going. Barry went and said, I'll see you later. Then I was kind of trying to decide, well, shall I just wait here or shall I, you know, go out because we were meeting some friends. So I, I went out uh, with these friends and uh, we were only in the village. He knew where I was. And um, One of the good ship tracking websites sort of is called marinetraffic.com. Pretty cool. More than a dozen men responded to the call, but only eight were needed. Trevelyan chose the best crew he had for that job, the ones he knew could do that job, the ones he could trust, or not trust, the, the best hands he had, the best crewmen he had for that job. He wanted his most experienced crew that night because it was a hellish night, and really, you know, he knew it was going to be tough. The RNLI is the Royal National Lifeboat. Trevelyan took Barry Tory, Kevin Smith, Nigel Brockman, and the lifeboat mechanic. Stephen Madron. He also chose Charlie Greenoff, the landlord of the local pub, John Blewett, hmm. and the 22 year old Gary Wallace. The eight were selected for their skill and experience, but none could have predicted the outcome of that terrible night. The crew were all there, all dressed which was really, you know, unusual for us because uh, lifeboat men dressed for the occasion, but everybody was dressed properly that night. I always remember Trevelyan helping Barry, Barry Tory with his life jacket because Barry didn't like wearing life jackets and uh, uh, he wouldn't wear one as a rule, but uh, that night he had to put one on and uh, Trevelyan had it. Nobody likes wearing life jackets, it, but just know? do it anyway. You never know. that. That's why All you the wear them for accidents. The stern of the lifeboat. You always stand around the stern when they lunched. And uh, that night Trevelyan got them all inside because it was such a, such a bad night, you know, with the... Sea and the spray breaking all right over the lifeboat after they put the mast up because the exhaust went up the mast <clears throat> and you had to put the mast up to, uh, you know, before you start the engines up. At only 17, Neil was too young. But Trevelyan was also keen not to take two members of the same family. I was absolutely gutted because I never went. I was upset because I never, because I wasn't asked to go. And I got to say, the boat was lost. I've never seen a piece of seamanship like that. To get that boat, people don't realize what the weather was like that night. To get that boat in the water was some piece of seamanship. And see, and that should tell you how dangerous they thought this the situation was. That the captain didn't want to take two people from the same family. So before they even launch, he launched. He realized there was a decent probability that they weren't coming back. I mean, that's kind of that. That kind of sets a. Uh, it's a little bit of a of an eerie edge over the story. We waited and waited and waited well, a few, quite a few minutes to catch the right moment to knock her off a slip. <laughs>
she went down the sea at the bottom of the slip and she went down behind the next one and was gone. But when we closed the doors up that night, Raymond and myself were the last two to leave the boathouse and the wind was whistling through the rafters, an awful eerie feeling. And there was always that suspicion it wasn't a very good, it would be a very good night. A 47 foot boat is um, about the uh, the size of a, of a decent yacht nowadays and as soon as they went down the slip they were they were in very rough seas and they would have been completely awash the decks would have been awash and even the after cabin water used to slosh around in it because of its self-draining situation so life on board even without going on deck um, would have been um, quite horrendous. You'd have breaking seas, breaking over the boat. The boat would be rolling all the time, pitching. Forward, back, up, and down. Like being, on, <laughs> in a, well, like being in a washing machine, I suppose is the best way to describe Just it. Just to say, I got like two 50 pound dogs under my chair and I can't put my legs anywhere. Like, get out of here, Yoda. I'm sorry, buddy. You got to go. I need to sit comfortably. You're killing my back. There we go. Apologies for the dog interruption. The Solomon Brain, you had, to, you had to physically drive around. You had to like work the engines, spin the wheels. It had been very hard to control that boat. As Trevelyan confirmed that the lifeboat had set off, the helicopter was already on the scene. The ocean was uh, very confused and, and getting worse. And uh, the casualty was on scene, bouncing significantly, rolling uh, in the sea. Well, they only had their navigation lights when they first came on scene. And we were attempting to effect a rescue at that point. And, uh, and then he put his anchor out and turned bow into the sea. And we asked him at that point, would he mind putting on his, his uh, you know, turn on some more lights so we could see the boat better and, and uh, position ourselves better and, and such. Because it was black night. We couldn't see a thing and couldn't see where the boat was moving very much. And so he turned on all his floodlights. We asked the crew if uh, they wanted to come off, and initially they were sorting Shame out, uh, trying to start the engines. And uh, and then from that point, as the weather was worsening and they were drifting toward the coast, and and uh, we were trying to get their attention that that was happening fairly quickly, uh, they then decided to remove uh, the woman and two children. And that was our first surprise with the, there was a woman and two children on board. How many people do you plan on transferring? Uh, one woman and two children, are there? Sorry, say again. One woman and two children, are there? Sorry, wow. say again. <laughs> one woman and uh, two children, the crew will remain aboard until, uh, until the last, are there? Yeah, so one woman and two children? Yes, that's correct. The woman was Morton's wife. And that's that's calm Coast Guard talk for what the hell are two women and what the hell's a woman and two children doing on that ship? 
repeating it three times when they clearly heard it the first time. That's the uh, you what. What do you mean there's a woman and two children on that ship? How come nobody told us this before now, voice? Two children? Yes, that's correct. The woman was Morton's wife, Dawn. The children were his stepdaughters. Ugh. He'd picked them up en route so that they'd be together for Christmas. Dawn's children came over from South Africa and they were going to stay in England and that's, that's why the reason why the girls were on board. I think it, it, it possibly had an effect on the thinking of the captain, certainly, because he would obviously um, have this emotional um, issue to deal with. It's bad enough just um, having to look after the crew, let alone your wife and um, two young girls who have probably never been on the ship before and then probably only been a couple of days on board the ship. They may have been seasick during, uh, during the passage. So um, it would have been very difficult. And another thing that I don't think is very well known that um, Dawn was actually pregnant at the time. I always hate when they don't have interviews with the woman. Uh, you just saw her yeah. so We have a bit of sorting out on this rope before we're ready. Bad sign. Yeah, all understood what we're standing by here. Be at least another five, six minutes. Yep, yeah, okay, all understood. Thank you. The wind was now freshening, probably well, at least 60 mile an hour, uh, probably more. The waves at that point were about 50 foot seas, and it was getting more difficult. There were times we had to uh, rapidly change our position because the ship was coming up and uh, higher than we expected. And uh, there were a couple of times that came very close to our, our rotors of the helicopter. If that happened, uh, it would break the rotors, we wouldn't be here. And uh, so we, we had to adjust a, a number of times uh, because the ship would suddenly pitch much more violently than, than was expected. Union Star, this is uh, Rescue 80, how do you read? Uh, Rescue 80, yes, that is clear. Tried lowering the, the crewman. The ship was sideways to the to the waves and such, and the confused sea, and it was rolling significantly and pitching, and it was difficult getting the, our crewman down. My concentration was on the deck that I was trying to get to. I'm at this stage not in communication with the aircraft. Uh, I'm at their, uh, their in their hands, and they're trying to put me onto that deck. And I, I do recall how very clean and uh, new the green painted deck looked. Mm. And I remember focusing on this piece of green deck and they brought the first lady out and uh, one of the men was effectively holding her against the bulkhead uh, standing on this deck. And I was focused on the deck and she'd got these, these bright pink court shoes on. Um, I, I, I couldn't tell you anything else about her, but looking at that piece of deck where I was aiming, uh, this is an enduring memory of these bright pink court shoes, which was so incongruous in that, uh, that violent uh, situation. Roger, Union Star, this is looking too difficult for Rescue 80 as far as safety is concerned. We're getting very close to your map, and we don't have a long enough high line. Now, when it's so bad that the Coast Guard rescue helicopter pilots can't get to you, it's a really, really bad situation. I mean, if any of you have seen shows like uh, Deadliest Catch and whatnot, these rescue helicopter pilots will go into virtually anything. And, you know, is, is, is uh, Steve's... Who, how, how is the guy related to you? Well, he's one of my, one of my closest friends. Yeah. It's her brother-in-law. Okay. I see whenever I go over, we, they, she has these great Christmas parties here and whenever I'm uh, hanging out, he'll show up and, and I'm like, and he's such a nice guy. And so, it, but he's, I love to get him talking about this dead, this story because he's, um, I mean, like you say, those Coast Guard pilots, what they do. I mean, he tells me stuff and it makes my bone bones chill because yeah. he's like black as night and the waves are above the rotors. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like what? Yeah, yeah. I and mean, these these 
these guys are stone cold brave mothers. Well, That's a lot of it too is mom. youth. A lot of it's youth. Yeah. You know, they don't, they're not smart enough yet to realize that they're mortal, right? You know, when you're young, you think you can do anything and conquer the world, and they they do most of the time, right? Yeah. And so, so if it's getting to the point where even the Coast Guard rescue guys is too dangerous for them, it, that 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 is a huge sign of that it it is just ridiculous weather, and they're on this relatively small boat with no power, no engines, nothing heading towards the rocks. The dreadful conditions had made a helicopter rescue too dangerous. The Union Star was less than a mile from the shore, and her fate now rested on the efforts of Trevelyan and his crew. So the old saying that women and children first, but I think it's still old now. I think you would go for women and children first, and you and it would make a difference. Although you're there to save any life is precious. That's what we're. That's what we do for a living. We save lives. We if we think we can save someone, we'll save someone. We've got four shackles of cable out. We've already lost one anchor. We've got four shackles of cable out trying to hold our position. Fucker. With the helicopter standing. Yeah, you're not going to be able to hold any position with the anchor. Like I said, they already lost one anchor because of the weather. You're, you're not going to be able to stay in place with an anchor in those weather. You'd be dragging your anchor like nobody's business. This is essentially a lost ship, but nobody seems to know it at this point. I don't know I don't know if the, if the Penn Lee lifeboat guys know it at this point, but I don't think the uh, captain of the yacht has realized it yet. But when you're dragging anchor and you've got nothing to do and the helicopter can't get to you and you're heading towards rocks, it's kind of a dead ship. Standing by, the Penley lifeboat fought to come alongside the Union Star. Yes, that's cool. Yes, sir. Message from our coxswain that uh, he, he advises you for everybody to come off. Over. Yes, we're all coming off. When we pulled off to let the, the lifeboat go in, they were now pretty well into the shallows and into the very severe breaking seas. Um, and we effectively sat and watched whilst they tried to effect that, uh, that rescue. You could see the Solomon Brown being bashed up against the side of the Union Star and, and the crew standing on the rail and, and uh, reaching out, trying to grab the ship throwing lines over, like the grappling hooks, to try and pull themselves alongside and steady themselves. The anchor was down, the anchor was holding it, but the anchor wasn't holding it steady. Can we just stop it now and have really a happy ending? How f yeah, I, I don't think, I don't think that's going to happen. Oh, and oh. sorry, I, I said it was a, it was a yacht. It's a, uh, so the, the Union Star, it was a mini bulk carrier that's like registered in Ireland. How large um, is that? The the Union Star, uh, I think they said it was like 46 foot. I mean, it's a tiny little ship. Oh, that was the uh, the Penn Leith lifeboat was 46. Was it? Yeah, so well, we how can, much is the Union Star? We can do that here. Union Star bulk carrier. Uh, now there's too many ships named Union Star now. I should have checked that beforehand, shouldn't I? This brand new mini bolt carrier launched only weeks before her disasters end. Uh, hmm. I'm not seeing anything readily available. So if anyone can throw up the, the the size of the vessel in the chat while we continue with the uh, with the thing, I I would appreciate it. But yeah, it was it was a just a, it was a tiny little bulk carrier. 
that had launched from uh, Denmark, I believe. Uh, December 11, 1981, set, set sail on Spaden voyage. Uh, yeah, from the Danish from Danish port. So it was going from from Denmark. Uh, 121 meters. Okay, so about 300 feet. That's a big ship. That's a big ship. Yeah, that, I don't, uh, we'll watch and, and see what happens here. Quickly, he was drifting toward the rocks. And that lifeboat, special eight zero, I saw it 300 yards from the coast. The breakers are quite large out here, and the lifeboat is having trouble getting alongside. The spray and the and the green water, as I would call it, were were uh, crashing up against wheelhouse, and it was getting very difficult. And now we're looking at 60, maybe 70 foot uh, waves. I can imagine how they probably felt on board because I'm sure it was shaking the ship and violently. Uh, and the risk of coming outside would have been uh, tremendous because uh, you don't know when in the dark sea and in the, in the rain when the next wave is coming. As it eventually went right into the surf, then the Union Star did start to roll very seriously. Um, I, I would think you know, in excess of 50 degrees. Uh, and at one stage, um, I did see the uh, Solomon Brown, the lifeboat, literally alongside the Union Star. And as she rolled, the lifeboat came up on her side. So she was effectively out of the water. Wow. Lifeboat. We're estimating uh, 10 minutes before they hit the beach. Did you say 10 minutes for the beach, John? About 10 minutes before they drift into the beach. We should go on that rapidly. Solomon Brown came in bow to bow to the Union Star, and as it was in the rocks, and I thought, this is incredible. What's he doing in the rocks? There really wasn't much room to maneuver, and the wind was gusting so violently. It was like being between two big boxing bags, you know, being thrashed about. A local journalist made his way down to the cliffs overlooking the scene. When I first arrived on, on the cliff, I could see the helicopter and I could see the Union Star being battered in the waves and I could see the lifeboat. And it was from there that I watched the whole incident unfold. Hmm. Uh, Union, uh, Union Star, uh, yeah, we're going to make a attempt here to get alongside you at the moment. Okay, skip, yeah. Trevelyan Richards. Yeah, so 70 meters, that's more, that, that, yeah, that's more accurate for a, a small bulk conditions. area. The way he positioned and got himself over those very, very steep uh, ways, in that sense, almost slowing it over, because you don't go straight. And the way he was uh, putting it was tremendous seaman, tremendous seamanship. And all of a sudden, there's a huge wave. I would think that the height of the wave was probably 50 to 60 feet high. Jeez. The lifeboat crew obviously saw this. They went astern quite hard. And I could see that from the cliff. They very nearly got over the crest of the wave. But the crest of the wave picked the lifeboat up and dropped the lifeboat across the deck <laughs> of the Union Star. Solomon Brown went up onto the Union Star. That's how bad Mother Nature is. It just took the rescue boat and deposited it on the deck of the Union Star. I mean, can, can you imagine being on either one of those, specifically the, the tiny little rescue boat, and seeing a wave 60 feet high? You know, essentially 20 meters, a 20 meter wave crashing that literally lifts you up and puts you on the deck of the ship with the people you're supposed to be rescuing. I mean, we've had some, we, we have, we have some big typhoons that come in every year and uh, there's, there's two rocks from two different typhoons that they've actually put plaques on down here. You get these typhoons that will roll these you know, 20, 30, 40 ton rocks and just throw them up on the beach like they're absolutely nothing. The kinetic energy of waves are ridiculous. Yeah, I've been Stop. surfing in 10-foot waves, but 
I've never, uh, and I've been out in the ocean, probably 15 foot waves. I can't imagine a 60 foot wave. I mean, people, people, I mean, I understand that North Sea and they're, they're out there, but it's, it's a pretty frightening thing. These, I mean, yeah. the, the fear, the, the awesome power and how, how small we are compared to nature. And like you things you'll see in, in movies like the perfect storm and whatnot, those waves can get so high that the ship will get part way up and it can't crest the wave and it will either fall back capsized on itself or the wave will just crush it. It'll slide back down and the waves will just crush it. And sometimes these waves on, if you've got a bigger ship will break the back of the ship, the yeah. ship will go over and then the, you've got it teeter tottering on the top and a ship's not made to do that. And it'll snap the ship right in half. Yeah. We've got a few of those lined up in the future. <laughs> the, the broke back ships <laughs> the wave picked the lifeboat up and dropped the lifeboat across the deck of the union star solomon brown went up onto the union star and uh, was well off the water at that point and i thought they were all going to go over together at that point point. and what would you do if you were watching that in a helicopter Ugh. But after sliding off the deck of the Union Star, the lifeboat managed almost immediately to get back alongside. And these are volunteers doing this. These guys are badass. In the dark, because it's very dark, you see shadows of people running out of the wheelhouse. And it appeared they were just jumping to the lifeboat. And the lifeboat crew is out with their, their arms out, you know, to catch them. Several people, looked like about five to us, ran out and jumped across to the Solomon Brown. They were would, would wearing their bright fluorescent orange uh, life jackets. So they were relatively easy to spot as they seemed to pass from one vessel to the other. And then uh, before the next breaker came in, they turned to seaward and and uh, in among all these rocks, and I don't see how they actually made it a turn to get seaward. And, and this huge wave came in and they went underneath it and disappeared and surfaced on the other side, basically like a submarine. And we assumed at that point that he was gonna continue going out to sea and head home. <laughs> nice Coast Jaws reference. Uh, they can't do the much when they reach and the cliffs. Feeling that we had done all that we could do. And we assumed that the Solomon Brown had had made the same decision. And uh, we're going to, you know, return to home. But the crew of the Solomon Brown hadn't made the same decision. They were about to make one final rescue attempt. That's not what you want to hear. You don't want to hear dead air. And the lifeboat farmer just got, I understand you have four off, and you say there's two left on board, ever? And the lifeboat, and the lifeboat farmer just got, ever? It's a devastating feeling when you hear that call, and the call, and the call, and nobody answers. It's just, gives you that very, very, hollow sick feeling in your stomach rose you know the rules no spoilers you know the rules better than anybody else unfortunately on the way back uh, one of the first things the people asked when we arrived as we're listening to people calling the solomon brown uh, they said have you heard from solomon brown and you get that very terrible sinking feeling that something's gone wrong terribly wrong
So we uh, refueled, uh, rinsed the engines with fresh water to clean up as much of the salt as we could and uh, launched again. In Mausel, Barry's wife, Lynn, was unaware of any problem with the lifeboat. I don't really remember thinking anything disastrous was going to happen. So, you know, came home at some point in the evening and made sure the boys were fast asleep and went to bed, which is, you know, was quite normal um, because if they went out thopters. On, a, on a shout, they were thopters you, you didn't in know doing what time. They were coming back. I didn't have a radio. I know a lot of uh, wives. Yes, or in doctors. Men, but doctors for we sure. didn't have one set up and uh, just assumed they'd be back. There was a brief glimmer of hope when someone claimed they could see the lights of the Solomon Brown. We continued to call the, the lifeboat. About three quarters of an hour later, the, the auxiliary lookout at Penza Point called in and, and reported seeing the lifeboat coming back to uh, Newley. So we, th we were quite heartened by that. We told the launching authority to expect them in Newley. And a whole bunch of people went down to Newley to meet her. And of course she never turned up. Nobody, nobody knows to this day what those lights were or why they were seen. Now, Rose, you can talk about the, the lights going out on the, on the lifeboat. Yeah. Don Buckfield made his way to the scene with the coastal rescue team. They could see the Union Star on its side, just below the cliffs. There was wreckage washing up and down with the waves, and I saw a life jacket with the, with the lights still working. Mm. And uh, on reaching the top of the cliff again, we become aware that uh, Falmouth was concerned for the lifeboat. And at that time, I could almost definitely say that that was a lifeboat jacket mm. in the water. The discovery of the life jacket confirmed that the worst had happened. The Penley lifeboat and the Union Star had been wrecked. A friend of mine who I'd been out with, a girlfriend, came knocking on the door. I, can't, I don't even know what time it was. And said uh, something's, something bad's happened to the lifeboat. And um, don't really, I don't really think much registered after that. Um, you know, I couldn't say anything specific because it was all just, uh, I just remember lots of people all the time thinking, we should all be quiet and wake the children up, you know. And I told them straight away as soon as they woke up the next day that their daddy wasn't coming home. Oh. Ah, oh, that would just be so... For Kevin's crazy. family, it was his brother who brought the devastating news. I can remember him coming into his mother's front room. And I've never seen grief like it. There is no grief that can compare to a mother losing her child. And Pat was a very, very, very strong woman. And what an awful thing for anyone to have to do. It's like now I can see it's playing back in my head like a video. I need just the disbelief and the shock. It was just such a sad time. By Cello. first light, Cellos are another sign nothing good's happening. For wreckage. <laughs> Many of those Cellos in a minor key are the family worst. and friends. That's the, uh, that's the Union Star right there. Personally, I was out searching for 10 days. 
Well, I think it was the fact that I was going to find Kevin alive, I suppose. So I just really kept searching, really thinking, again, is it a futile search, but something in you said, you've got to keep going. Hoping that you will find someone, you know. Yeah, just crashed up on on the rocks, flipped upside down, crashed on the rocks, and disintegrated. We These shorelines are crazy. Bits and pieces yeah. of bodies. Bits and pieces of bodies. That happened, you know. No, that was it, really. <laughs> yeah, we only found one whole body. And that was Nigel's, my mate. Uh. In the end, only eight bodies were recovered, four from the Solomon Brown and four from the Union Star. That coastline is rough. I'm from Florida. We have flat, sandy beaches. And do your and... job and live to do it again. And, uh, and when some of your own are taken, it hurts. It hurts deeply. Yeah, we said they were finding bits and pieces of other bodies. I mean, you, you just get them, just, they just rub on the rocks, you know, get smashed by the ship. Yeah. You can't imagine the, the bravery of people like that. You know, it's just to put their life on the line. You know, they're the salt of, of the earth. You know, they're the, the fathers, the brothers, the sons. And they're volunteers. They're not required to do that. Things like Christmas Eve, we was burying Trevelyan in the morning, my father in the afternoon, and the box day we had more funerals. It was it was hard going. You weren't allowed your own private grief. Um, everything you did was noticed. Everything you said was written. So it was very, very difficult. You know, just going out of the house was impossible. And it's a small village, so probably everyone the ashes knew of dawn, someone or one of all of them were scattered out at sea close to where the Union Star was wrecked. Dawn's other daughter and Henry Morton were never found. Which coast is this on? This is a... Uh... My mother took it very badly. It's off the coast of Cornwall. She couldn't really accept it, particularly with um, Mick's body not being found. So I don't think she ever accepted it till the day she died that he was uh, actually lost. I think she believed he was suffering from amnesia and was wandering around the... Um, the West Country somewhere, and one day he would come back and knock on the door. So just the, the very southwest tip of England. Fifteen months later, there was a formal inquiry into exactly what happened. It raised questions about Morton's actions and the decisions he made that night. It was very difficult. You know, I'd have preferred to have been able to speak to some of the people, um, families from the lifeboat, but um, uh, I don't know, it was a very difficult position for me to be in at the time, particularly with all the criticism was going on, etc. And um, I, I found it very hard. His only crime, as far as I know, that he was a little overconfident about how fast he was drifting into land. He was drifting into land a lot faster than he thought he was. Um, and I think he was slightly on the optimistic side about, about that. 
One of the issues examined was why Morton declined the salvage tow when it was first offered. And when they suddenly decided they wanted a tow, it was too late because the, the tug couldn't couldn't get in. Mm -hmm. It was too shallow for the tow to get in to put a line on. They should have been forced to take a tow hours before she even got anywhere near the shore. Now the rules have changed somewhat and the Coast Guard can initiate a May Day on behalf of uh, a ship's master. And indeed we have the powers to uh, require a ship's master to take a tow if that's what we deem appropriate. Um, we don't have to be a passive responder anymore. We can take the initiative. The inquiry concluded that no one was to blame for the tragedy and that the events of that night were the result of water getting into the engine of the Union Star and above all, the extreme severity of the weather. When the inquiry uh, results of the, or the findings of the inquiry came out, um, uh, my brother was exonerated and that really the cause of the tragedy was various small things that all added up to this as, big jigsaw. As Stephen said. But at the end of the day, it was the sea that done them, no one else. When you live by the sea and you, you live with the sea, things happen, and this is this is what, why we need lifeboats. You know, things like this happen. I mean, you can't blame anyone. That's, that's what you get living by the sea. I mean, every year there's there's probably 30, 40 fishermen lost every year around the British coast. For the 25th anniversary of that tragic night, Russell Smith has come over from America to pay his respects. My wife and I wanted to make a connection. And that's really the main reason we're back. Just to visit, say hello, say we care. And uh, say we'll never forget. Hello there. I'm Russ. You can't remember me. <laughs> Dudley? Yeah, Dudley. Yeah, and Raymond? Which man at that time? Raymond. We've met before. Yes, yes. Sure we have. Never forget. Never, ever, ever. And, you know, How could you forget? All my children now, I tell them about the story as well, you know, so because it is something which should never be forgotten. You know, the heroism and uh, the brave deed done that night should always be remembered. Falmouth Coast Guard, Falmouth Coast Guard, Penny Lifeboat. Penny Lifeboat, Falmouth Coast Guard, go ahead over. Falmouth Coast Guard, Penny Lifeboat, yeah, for information, we're now leaving doing all the loss of the Solomon Brown didn't stop the people of Mausel maintaining the lifeboat tradition. Today, the Penley lifeboat is based a couple of miles from Mausel, in the fishing village of Newlyn. Neil Brockman, turned away by Trevelyan for being too young, is now the coxswain. Huh. I was asked by the RLI, for the RLI to become coxswain, and to start with, I didn't want to do it, because I thought I was too young. I was only 28 years old at the time. I didn't think I was experienced enough or old enough to do the job and they did beg me to, or really persisted to ask me that to do it so i said i would so i said i would take it for 12 months to see how i got on i've been here ever since so. <laughs> i've also thought neil's the best man for the job anyway because he's totally committed to his crew and they are on the line i know he's you know a very good friend of mine but i'll always stand by that as a, on a professional field, he's a, a, he's a hell of a coxswain. I've done every job on the boat, crewman, right up from crew to mechanic, coxswain mechanic, now full-blown coxswain with the mechanic. I mean, first, I think I got the best team in the RLI, the best crew, but then everyone would say that any station you go, but I am lucky I got a very experienced crew. Every one of my crew are seamen or ex-fishermen or they are actually, they're all to do with the sea. So I'm lucky in that way. His father would have been very proud of him, and he was very proud of his father, and, and so that was a sort of public thing, but also a private thing. It's just such an honor to, to, 
to know that they're carrying on in the tradition of the Royal Life Blood Institute, and that these people don't do it for money. They do it for the, the giving, the volunteer work that gives life to other people, really, because they still go out on rescues and assist other people in very difficult conditions all the time. Twenty-five years later, the old lifeboat station is empty. Kept exactly as it was in 1981, it stands as a memorial to the crew of the Solomon Brown. I just can't imagine how awful it must have been for them. Having a young daughter myself and, and uh, young children, it just must have been horrendous. And I can only imagine that they would, were just going to do everything they could. There's no way they could have said, oh, we can't, you know, it's too dangerous, we can't do this anymore, and just turn around and, and come back home. I mean, you know, it's just not something they would have done. Hmm. I got no doubt in the back of my mind that if I'm on a shout on my lifeboat with six of my crew, there's eight other crewmen with me. No doubt with that whatsoever. They'll never be forgotten. I'm just proud that I sailed with them all. Do them all personally. Good stuff. Interesting. A lot of bravery there, you know? <sighs> yeah. You know, the... Uh, Sort of, this is sort of a random thought. I'm always thinking about technicalities, I guess. Mm. But you know, those really, those are some brave, uh, brave people. You know, and those people are out there right now, today. It's not just people in the past. There's people, the fishermen and the Coast Guard and these, like these volunteers. I mean, this is like the real people that make the world run, you know, and that put their lives on the line for everybody else. It's easy just to say, oh, this is something that happened in the past, but you know, these people are here today, you know? Yeah. And like I said, I mean, still, it just amazes me. These are, these are volunteers. They, they didn't have to do any of this, but they willingly agreed to put their life on the line for friends, village members, acquaintances, we're, and just other complete, seamen that they don't even strangers. know. Yeah. Complete strangers. It's not even they're They're doing it because, uh, you know, that's their mission and they found their a purpose and uh, there's a need. This is this is what good people, good free people do. Uh, it's really um, um, I salute the the brave merchant marine. Uh, you know, the, looking at those rocks, it doesn't compute in my brain because you know, like I said, I'm from Florida. Yeah. And we had uh, you know the open boat with Stephen Crane. Are you familiar with that boat? Yeah. That story. Yeah. It, Stephen Crane. That actually um, that ship wrecked right off of Ormond Beach, where I'm from. Hmm. Stephen Crane was right here. And uh, and actually, that the ship that he was on was, I think it's it was their same ship, wrecked here, and then was actually, the wood is used to build a house. You can go see it, and there's a house made out of the wood from the wrecked oh, really? ship. Yeah, right here wow. in Ormond Beach. So, yeah, Stephen's Crane Open Boat is where our, our community is kind of known for that. Hmm. And so, I mean, it's this is the, the way of the seamen for you know, centuries. Wow. Hmm. I mean, th th these stories are always just fascinating. We, we, I, we do have to get poor. Uh, I hope you're still here, by the way, Daryl Smith, you've been waiting an hour for this super chat. Okay. <laughs> Sorry about that. Ask the Titanic about maiden voyages. Yeah, there's that. And it's, it's kind of also considered to be a, a major jinx. If you describe anything as being unsinkable, yeah, that's that's, that's, that's terrible. It's literally one of those jinx things that you just never want to say around a, ve a vessel, unsinkable. Well, there's so much. That's why there's so much um, superstition because nature is not within human control. Yeah. So you get, you know, and there's, we like to think that we have control over things. So we create superstition is one of the ways because it's like, well, if I do this, if I tap this and run around this circles, then somehow that gives me some measure of control over the nature, which is 
greater than us. And the you know the videos and the uh, the data that I see for some of these accidents things just it it just emphasizes that on this earth we're essentially parasites. Mother Nature cares as little about us as we do about the thousands and thousands of dust mites that are on our eyelids and eyelashes and not on our skin. We don't need Mother Nature does not respect any of us. Well, I was going to ask you kind of a different yeah. different little topic, and and that is, I know that um, my wife works at local aeronautical university, Embry Riddle Aeronautical University. I don't know if you're familiar with Embry Riddle. But it's an excellent school no. and that teaches pilots. And there's a very specific, there's actually a language that the pilots have to use. It's English, but it's very formalized and codified and direct. So that the, the, there's like it's like air traffic controllers speak. Yeah. Um, do do naval is a naval, is there a naval speak? Is there an analog to that in the naval? Yeah, pr- well, I mean, pretty much. I mean, for emergency situations to avoid any re- any any possibility of doubt, you know, I mean, like like Mayday means a specific thing. You just don't say Mayday for no reason. That means you were doomed. We need, and you say it three times so people will you know, can hear it clearly. Basically, any emergency instruction you give, you repeat it three times for clarity's sake. And the, the, and there are just like the basic, you know, the uh, what would you call it uh, the just the, 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 the industry specific vocabulary that you would use. I wonder because my, uh, you know, remember, I don't know if you're the worst airplane disaster, I think ever was in the, I think it was in the Azores and the two 747s crashed mm-hmm. in takeoff. I don't know if you remember that. I don't remember that. Yeah, it was. Um, and they, they found that it was because they were using different language or basically oh, using um, yeah. that the language was not as formalized. So out of that disaster, I forget how many hundreds of people were killed, but it was two fully loaded 747s that got, you know, one was taking off and he, another was crossing the prop and it it clipped like this. And, um, and the, and that was the, from what I understand is that was part of that or a lot of that was because of the the lack of formalization of language. I'm wondering if, um, have you seen similar type things in a maritime situation where communication yeah, here it is. Well, you, you get ships from all over the world, and I mean, everybody speaks different languages on the ships. You'll have captains that are from every every country in the world, but Eng- they're supposed to use English. They're supposed to have some level of English proficiency. But it's but, not just English. It's it, the the thing is they were both speaking English, but it was yeah. actually they weren't oh, using a. It's so structured. the The language is so structured that it's it's almost mathematical. Because of the the, the vagaries yeah. in the English, you know, as you as a lawyer know, I mean, English is a very, well, most language is just a representation of something else. And so it's can very vague and language is a blunt tool, not a specific tool. Yeah. I mean, in, not so much in merit, in maritime situations, I mean, it's you know, people have been sailing ships for hundreds of years, near, I mean, thousands, if you want to go back to the ancient Greek triremes and whatnot, but it's, it's sort of, it's become codified, whereas we've only been flying for like a hundred years. Um, but so you'll, you'll get the standardized language and then the, the rules for navigation are really quite simple. There's, I think it was like there's, they have these collision regulations that the UN has codified that for, for the UN purposes, but most countries either follow the, the, the collision regulations, it's like the United Nations, something on the colli- rules for avoiding collisions this year. Anyway, dudes call them coal regs collision regulations I think there's like 26 rules that basically say in this this type of ship has to stay out of the way of this type of ship if ships are inside of each other this is how they have to this is how they have to act in overtaking situations crossing situations head-to-head situations there's a set rule and a lot and of that was developed, happened because somebody's well, not paying attention to the rules a lot of that was developed by the british right i mean the british yeah. are kind of the leading naval power and yeah. a lot of the laws of the seas i mean you're the admiralty guy i'm asking because yeah. i don't know is yeah. that that's true yeah and uh you know this this is a good point too you ship people you have radios <laughs> but a lot of people just don't use them I am dealing with three different cases now where th- we're in each situation, two ships collided with, with each other and nobody tried to communicate with each other by the damn radio they had. 
Here's Sean Walters in the chat. See, he picked yes. it up. He 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 knows more than I do there. Language barrier and loss of radio cross traffic. Mm. So it became like they were cross they're cross talking, and I think yeah. some of them missed a signal. That's why there's a there's a there's a reply. You know, it's all very yeah. formalized. They teach that. Yeah. Like I said, the Embry Riddle Uni Aeronautical University, they teach that language. And you'll see there's some uh there's in the airline context, there's people get real loosey goosey with their language. And their traffic controllers are having none of it. They get they get strict and they write reports real quick on that because I mean there was a lot of people were killed in that because of that. Yeah, I mean like the the the, the best examples I guess you would have is like Mayday. Mayday specifically means we have an emergency situation and we need help. We need rescue right now. And you'll you repeat it three times. You're required to repeat everything three times, like I said, for clarity to make sure you didn't mishear something. Or if you go, wait, we heard so what was that? What did we hear? So it gives you enough time to be like mayday, 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 and then you say whatever your emergency is. Now, do you have and, a do you have a yeah a maritime background? I mean, no. like, do you sail or do you go in ships or anything? Or maybe not, not after seeing all. this, right? It's yeah. like <laughs> just just when I have to go on board ships for investigations and things. Because I, I I did some I did some personal injury where I did civil litigation for about six years, and we covered we did some I'd say higher end PI work. Mm -hmm. I will never, I will never buy a motorcycle <laughs> <laughs> after seeing the injuries that, you know, and here I am in Daytona, which is like bike week central, but boy, seeing the, uh, seeing the, the loss from people getting on these motorcycles and getting arms, legs severed, you know, it's <laughs> like, it's, I guess it's similar yeah. to what you're seeing probably in boats, right? Yeah. Well, yeah I was, I was seeing in motorcycles. I I shattered my femur in one accident, broke both of my arms in another one. Uh, I've seen it from the road. <laughs> I've been on the road looking up a few times. Uh, a couple of super chats and uh, just other messages that I tagged while this was going on to clear here real quick. Uh, he asked Titanic about maiden voyages. We did that one already. You get a two for there, Daryl Smith. And for two seventy nine, what a deal, a Canadian. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and Sonny or Chris says, uh, this is one of the reasons why U.S. Army medevac crews cannot launch without approval from the command. The drive to get your fellows out sometimes can blind you to the risks involved. Mm. True. And that's always thing with you with, with the, whether it's Coast Guard or whatever, your police or it's like, why didn't you do it? Why didn't you? They have a the primary responsibility is to protect your own safety. If you can ensure your own safety, then you help others. Because if you're going to go out and you're not going to come back from it, you're going to be absolutely no use to anybody else. So a lot of times that, that's a factor to consider. Uh, Xcomer, Triple Z, if you have some spare time, Steve, internet historian with Costa Concordia is high related. Xcomer, don't recommend someone else's channel. Go watch my review of the Costa Concordia. Don't recommend internet historian. I like Scott, but go watch my review of the Costa Concordia. The dialogue <laughs> between the Coast Guard and the captain of that ship is unbelievable. <laughs> oh, you know? Yeah. Like I'm ordering you to go back on that ship, right, and help out. He's yeah. like, I don't know. I'm just driving. I'm I'm leaving now. You know, he's playing dumb. Whatever happened to that yeah. captain? Did he? Uh... Oh, he's in jail for a very long time. Okay. That's yeah, ex good. Direct people to my review of the Costa Concordia, and then go watch Scott. <laughs> I like Scott, but watch mine first. Oh, Jessica reloaded in chat. Hey, Jessica, what's up? Where'd you go, Jessica? You said you had a chat there and I missed it. Whatever. You're here. Hi, Jessica. Good morning. Uh righto. Back to the, the comments. We have um, uh that's all right. You want to preview your uh oops. Well, uh, uh wrestler mom Jeff, I'm hoping your next trial is the OnlyFans girl. Um, I just mentioned that at the beginning. Tomorrow we'll be doing a background on the only OnlyFans murder. So I'm not gonna be here tomorrow. I'm sorry. Yeah, I would like to help you out on that, but the um, what what stage? I mean, we're not near to trial, right? This no, is, the the bond hearing was a couple of days ago. Bond so hearing is going to get denied. Come on, yeah, of course it is. <laughs> I mean, uh, it's like a, it's a preview. I mean, it's like spoiler. I don't know anything about it. But <laughs> it's a murder case. Yeah, murder case. You don't get bond. Not in Florida. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yeah, so, so we'll do that. We'll do the background tomorrow, and uh, legal mindset will probably be joining me for that as another Floridian. 
Uh, he'll be offering his insights into that. He's been doing something. And then uh, Wednesday and Friday, we'll be doing day one and day two of the bond hearing. It's kind of dull. Bond hearing? Yeah. What? Well, it's, what? it's interesting because the, the father is going to be testifying about uh, how much money she had. And uh, of course, he's presenting it. And then, well, she has lots of money so she can post a bond. But the prosecution's like, oh, you mean she has lots of money so she can flee and run away? <laughs> that much money? And how he was funneling her 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 money into his account uh, under like fictitious uh, reporting things. I mean, hundreds of thousands of dollars to protect the money from her uh, spendthrift things. It, it it's wild. And then yeah, there's there's the the police officers testifying and whatnot. It's it's not riveting, but it's not. Com- there's some dull parts, but it's not completely boring. So I've just we'll never watch heard that. of a two day bond hearing. Yeah, it's a two day bond hearing. <laughs> uh, you'll you'll have to run it at like one point seven five or something. Well, it's it's four, it's four hours one day and three hours the next. Day. Oh, okay, it's split. Still, that's a yeah. long time. Usually, that's done when on the state's behest, when there is an inquiry. Like usually on not on a murder case, but some sort of organized crime thing, where there's there's a, the the state sniffs that there's a lot of illicit funds out there. I forget, I can't remember the name of the hearing. I don't do them. I'm a public defender. So, so you know? Anders, Anderson or Alderson or something like that? Oh, yeah, I think something like that. Um, Alder, Alders here and Alderson yeah, hearing. Yeah, something, something like, like that. that, yeah. Anyway, it's, uh, it's the state basically sounding the depths of their money. And, uh, and I want you to prove that, you know, or, or somehow, like, if somebody has a lot of money stashed away, that they can keep the gangsters in jail. Um, yeah. Yeah. So, so dad was talking about all these, all this amount of funds. So, you know, so she can make the bond if you just said it and the prosecutor's like, oh yeah. So enough to run away to enough, to, enough to flee the country. eh? Okay. But if we're at a bond hearing, I mean, that trial's a ways off. Oh yeah. It's going to be way, it was scheduled for December, but no, no trial goes that way. It'll be months and months and months. If not, so she well must have next private year. counsel too, right? Uh, yeah. 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 Only fans model got really stabby with her boyfriend. Uh, we'll do be like I said, we'll be doing the background tomorrow. Then Wednesday and Friday we'll be doing the bond hearing. Thursday will be OJ Simpson day, as always. Back to OJ Simpson now that uh, Matthew Terry's finished. So don't don't fret, wrestlers, mom. We'll be here, and uh, Legal Mindset should be able to be here for some, if not most, of that. I wish he'd done the Shabusiness trial. Oh, we're gonna get the Taylor Shabusiness trial. We're we're still quite a ways away from that. There was a hearing last uh, Friday. A, a status hearing, which is basically the lawyers getting together and going, how close to trial are we? Uh, this was the, there's no reports out on the Friday hearing yet. As soon as, as soon as there's anything uh, reported about what happened last Friday, I'll, I'll do a bit of a stream on it. But basically the fourth mental evaluation of Taylor's business was, was ordered and it was, the results were expected to be back by the 18th. There's no reporting. So I'm, I'm thinking they didn't get the reports back in time. Uh, are you familiar with the Taylor Shabusiness trial in Wisconsin? There's something in Wisconsin water. Uh, her and her boyfriend did this amazing drug cocktail of marijuana, uh, crystal meth, and trazepan, and uh, they started getting into the into the the kinky uh, kinky sex thing with collars and chains. And uh, she choked her boyfriend out, blacked out during it uh, allegedly, and she recovered her consciousness while choking him out. And said, "Well, I've gone this far. I may as well see what happens." Uh, she made a puzzle out of his body parts and organs left his head and his other head in a bucket at the bottom of the stairs for his mother to find, uh, and ran away. And the police showed up later at her house. She's still covered in blood. And then she basically told the police, uh, what they got wrong in their assertions about her. Uh, so yeah, she's, wow. They, they well, you, not usually guilty. there's usually there's, um, you know, I've always said cocaine is the murder drug. I've seen yeah. cocaine is usually behind about 75% of the murders that I see. There's some kind of cocaine involvement, whether somebody's intoxicated with the cocaine, they want cocaine. There's, but boy, I'll tell you, meth. I haven't had as much experience, but I've seen a lot of um, meth heads doing some nutty things. Well, so. in, in Florida, it, it's bath salts and alligators. <laughs> yeah, yeah, <laughs> well, and, and alligators on bath salts, probably. Yeah, bath salts. <laughs> I don't know about that. That's really. Uh, I don't even know what the hell that stuff is. I, I had a frightening experience with bat salts um you know we cover public defender's office we cover um baker acts which people yeah. that are committed involuntarily for mental like and, a 72 uh, hour hold well 
they get in there and then of course we they're in custody against their will so they're entitled to a public defender and i remember this one lady she came in she was catatonic they wheel her into a wheelchair and she's drooling she's got her both her parents there maybe a 35 40 maybe 35 year old woman and uh the parents said that she was a uh she was a nurse an rn and had gone to a party mm. and taken bath salts and i'm looking i was like oh my god and she's just basically drooling herself catatonic and i said well how long has she been like this they said three weeks three weeks and i said what <laughs> and she and i said and i asked the doctor i said um is there is she gonna come out of this and they're like we don't know i mean what basically going from an rn going to a party and taking this bath salts to three weeks catatonic and she might be like that permanently i'll tell you that that's a frightening it's i mean they should take it's it's it is a frightening thing I, these drugs that people take i don't get it because it's the, the parents i'll never forget those parents because they were well, my, there for my, their daughter they're standing behind their daughter and they're they're there for her and she's just zoned out yeah my my older brother was on drugs for a a, a good chunk of his life before he got clean uh, that's why I never had any desire ever to do any illegal drugs because I just saw what it did to him. Uh, well, gotta, yeah, it was. See, I don't know. More. It's just because people. The thing is, is you're taking this stuff and you don't know what you're taking. It's an illegal yeah. substance, so it's you know it could be. And lighter you didn't fluid, watch it, you know? I mean, who yeah. knows what it is? Yeah, what it's laced with, how you're reacting, you never know. Oh, we, oh, we, we already did that one. Oh, yeah, we did that one. Go away. Go, go, go away, Excomer. Shoo, shoo. Uh, Joe Choi, thanks, Legal Vice, for another great Maritime Monday. Well, hopefully we'll continue to deliver. Uh, that's what we're here for. And uh, Mustang McCracken, I wish he'd done this in business trial. We just did that. So we're going to be doing that as soon as we get more information. Uh, that should probably go to trial sometime early next year. She she pled guilty, and then she recently changed her, her uh, plea to not guilty by reason of insanity or whatever they call it in Wisconsin. And so that, that triggered another mental evaluation um pastor of muppets says i have reason I, i've been in rough seas around cape hatteras on a converted asheville asheville class gunboat i've never been so seasick i have pics of waves breaking over the cabin yeah and that's that's the that's what we, we say a lot in the uh in the maritime monday deals once the waves start crashing over the deck you're you got to be careful and if you start to list and the water comes up over the deck you're in real trouble I'm just always, I'm just a, I'm impressed by his little picture and his name, <laughs> Pastor of Muppets. That's clever. Yeah. <laughs> and Mr. K, Legal Vices reminds me of my favorite quote. There are three things all wise men fear, the sea in a storm, a night with no moon, and the anger of a gentle man. Patrick Rothfuss, Kingkiller Chronicles are a great series of books if you, if you, if you haven't read them, Stephen. Have uh, you ever read uh, Nine Princes in Amber by Roger Zelazny? I have not. I and I love Zelazny. I just, I've just never read that one. Oh, you got it. That's that's my favorite fantasy novel of all time. Great, great, great. Highly recommended. You like the port, right? Yeah. Oh no, I I, I love Zelazny. I, just, I have like quotes. I keep I write down quotes for that I read from books on my phone, and he actually has one of my favorite book quotes. If I, if I can find it real quick, uh, where's my where's my book quotes? Oh, shoot. Th this is why I write them down, because I can never remember them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I know. I actually have a whole big document. It's like 10, 15 pages of great quotes. Because my, my my favorite Zelazny short story is uh, The Immortal. Okay. Which is like, this: the, the world has been destroyed in some sort of apocalypse. And this immortal guy, he just wanders around as like some sort of like immortal librarian guy. And, and just because I love Zelazny writes with he, the way he uses language and, and the humor he puts in, in language. I just love it. He was talking about these six legged cows that were turning a wheel. And he said, the, they'd been watching a weary six legged cow turn a great, a great sake wheel in much the same way as cows have always turned great sake wheels. But this only this one left more footprints. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, when you, re you read the nine princes and Amber and it's a series, I think of six books um yeah. nine princes and amber is probably my favorite first novel the way it opens and the way it unfolds and reveals itself is just brilliant 
and you get done with there's a whole I'm, the fact that a major movie I know that there's an estate and they got to sell the rights yeah. to it but yeah. it, it's so visual and it's so great there should it's like you know they they're looking for good fodder for movies and that the Hollywood's so bad they should look yeah. at that because some director needs to make the nine princes and amber and the amber chronicles uh into a movie because it's so vivid and visual i'd say my favorite science fiction series is dune i try to read the whole six books in the dune series at least once every couple of years and the uh, asimov's foundation and Earth foundation yeah i was novels. gonna say his foundation that pv series was terrible uh, uh, well, if you separate the books from the tv series it was acceptable no, I di I even disagree with that. I I, okay. I would have said because you know I, I I I mean it was painful that last episode where they're like, yeah. you know they yeah. always like get the guns and they like and then they've got the big machines and they're, yeah. uh, it's, uh, <laughs> the but also from that same threat. that same Rogers Elosny immortal story it was a great see this is such a descriptive thing that is it describe it's like. Uh, it's like Lovecraft. He describes things by not describing them by saying, yeah. hey, you, it, it was, it was a horrific beyond language. I mean, that says something, but Robert, Robert Rogers, Elosny said uh, red wig was there distracting me by being there and being distracting. <laughs> I just love that quote. Do you know, uh, do you know Elric? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Dude, El oh, I don't, I don't have it within, within arm's reach. So that's one of my favorite series. I'm right in the middle of uh, rereading the series right now. Yeah, because they've been. just re-released all three. They've they've com compiled everything into three volumes. They've just released them this year with the forwards by Neil Gaiman. Probably my favorite last book, Stormbringer. Mm. Yeah, that's, yeah. Oh, that's a classic. I, I I love the Elric series, and see that that means you're old school fantasy. If if you're bringing Elric in, I used to have Elric posters and things. Elric was my hero when I was a kid. Uh, back to the <laughs> back to the comments here. Oh, we got this one here. Uh, King Killer Chronicles. It's one of those George R. R. Martin things where it's a three book series and he finished the second book like a billion years ago and he hasn't written three yet, but it'll come here someday. Uh, AMN UCC Amnook, are you planning on the Derbyshire for the future shows on Brack Broke Back Ship? Now, that is not on my list, but um, it will be now. Derbyshire. Okay, it's now on the list. Thank you. Have you ever done the Stephen Crane open boat? I have not. You should do that one. I've seen the book. Yeah. But I, I have, I've, I've, I've never read it and uh, I haven't, have no, well, okay, add that to the list. Why not? <laughs> Open boat. Uh, corn pipe. Did anyone live? I missed that part. And everyone in that last story we did died. Everyone from the ship and everyone from the rescue boat mm -hmm. died. Not a, not a single soul lived. Nice. Happy day. And again, Ice Deadman 666 become a YouTube member. Thank you so much for joining the members. Pleasure to have you aboard, so to speak. Uh, IDY Mond. Uh, I wish I knew how to pronounce some of these things. I like how Legal Vices does these types of streams we need to remember. That's kind of what I'm doing for you. There's Mayday and Pan Pan for pilots. For me. The same, that's the thing. Mayday, 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 and Pan Pan, Pan Pan, Pan Pan. That's, that's like Mayday Light. That's the, we're having problems, please stand by, the, the pon pon. You repeat that three times. And then when it gets out of control, then you hit the mayday and that comes. So yeah, it's just the same for, uh, same, same in, the, in the vessel world. Uh, I am Dave. Any idea how I can find out if a trial is being televised? You pretty much just have to look online and see if it's being televised. I'm an Abilene and I am curious about the Dumpster Brothers case. As, I haven't heard whether that's being televised or not. I hope it's being I hope it's being televised because that will be that will be a good trial to follow. You, you, are you familiar with the Dumpster Brothers case that shotgunned no. each other over a mattress outside of a dumpster? No, that's where that's where Nick's uh, little quote says, "I doubt it" comes from. I don't know if you've seen that. Uh, yeah, two guys uh, arguing over a mattress in front of a dumpster, and one of them ends up daring the other one to shoot him. Takes a few steps forward and gets shotgunned. People don't realize, uh, yeah. see, that's this is most of my life. I deal with these cases. <laughs> and so when I'm like not like at work, I don't pay yeah. attention to a lot of this media stuff. I only have been recently because you guys are asking me to comment on it. But as far as like what's in the media, I don't watch media. I mean, to hell with the media. So yeah. it's like, you know, they're so they just want to antagonize me and get me upset. And I like I've got a happy life. I don't want to be upset. So uh, they, they they pay me to deal with this stuff. But 
otherwise I'm going to be reading my Elric and my, somebody yeah. said Hyperion. I've got a, that's on the list. I'm reading Olympian or Olympus and Iliad uh, by that same author right mm -hmm. now. But, yeah. uh, and my son wants me to read Hyperion. Oh, Hyperion's a great book. I love yeah. Hyperion. And that, that's a great audible. It's, it's a great audio book too. A great, great narrator on audible. Uh, Mega bitch. Legal vices. Have you read the Elric graphic novels? If you're talking about the uh, ones from the late eighties, I have them in mint condition in my uh, parents' basement. Well, I, I hope they're still my, because my dad moved into retirement homes. I hope, I hope they're in the storage facility somewhere because they're worth a ton. We got rid of these. Even... You don't want all these comic books. We threw them away. I know you don't want them really anymore. Dude, dude, you just triggered me. Don't do that. You, you just made my heart squinch because my dad cleaned my room one day and threw out a first edition Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. I told it you I have, worth a, I have a 2500 first... bucks at the time he threw it away in the 90s. Now they're selling for about 32 to 62 depending on condition. Get out. You know, I just thought it was, it was a 95 cent comic. I'm like, yeah, dad, these are collectibles. The People only comic right book I have here. that I would retain, I got a bunch of comics I'd love to get rid of, but I've got a bunch of like number one Punishers, but the one that I have oh. is a, a number one Silver Surfer in mint condition. Oh, cool. That's, that's cool. the one that it's, I've always been yeah. a Silver Surfer fan and I love yeah. that. Lo lo love Joe Satriani for doing the, for doing that album. Oh, surfing with the alien. Yeah, yeah, I was in a surfer when I was in middle school. So, that so was I was working at a heavy metal station back then. We we got the uh, we got the single CD for playing at the station, and it it, it, it was just a CD with a Silver Surfer on it. It was, it was really it was really cool. I've got that somewhere in the other room. Uh, but yeah, if you're talking about the uh, 1980s graphic novels, I've got all of them. Great, great graphic yeah, my, novels. Yeah, my mom donated all my Legos, which I was like, don't. That's like. Legos have value. It's like coin yeah. of the realm, you know. Why are you throwing or giving Legos away to the thrift shop? Why'd you do that? Oh, I, I've got I've got two friends here that are huge into Legos. You know, in in their in their thirties and forties. I mean, they, like, what are you doing? Oh, I'm building the Coliseum now, and they, <laughs> they've got these huge Lego layouts. And I mean, serious stuff. Don't don't go. Don't throw people's stuff away, parents. Yeah, they the mean things to the kids. Your Professor fear. Pelican, thanks thanks for such a decent, sensitive stream on the Penley Lifeboat. I'll definitely try to catch Maritime Mondays from here on. Oh, please do. It's it's not the most popular stream we do. It's not the most lucrative from the uh, grift sense, but I really enjoy doing it because it's the one thing I have any vague idea of what I'm talking about. Because like Steve said, people would be horrified if they knew how little I watch the news. Right. I mean, I just catch it briefly in passing, go go through uh my, my startup screen screen is the drudge report so i just blaze through the headlines then you i click over forget and... drudge report go over to uh, citizen I... citizen free press well the three things i do is i'll, I'll that's my startup screen so i just kind of look for the major high points then i go to youtube new i mean uh, yahoo news and just kind of scan oh. through that then i then i hit instapundit for about 20 minutes okay and that's now we're and talking then. instapundit so that, that's just kind of my news in a nutshell but like you said I, I want, and I don't read a lot of, you know, uh, nonfiction I'll do if there's something particularly interesting, but normally it's, it's, it's fantasy and science fiction. Cause I want to escape from reality just for a couple of hours a day. It's exactly the same thing. Actually, my, most of my reading is nonfiction. I read, like, I read history basically. I, I, mean, I need I the read... series name for the Elric books you're reading. Loved everything else you mentioned. Um, the Go first one is Elric of Melnabone. It's by the author's name is Michael Moorcock. Michael Moorcock, yeah. So um, there, go to Amazon and search for Elric and uh, Neil Gaiman, G I M A N, because he does the he does the four. It's they've uh, they've compiled them into three larger novels, into the you know, to, to three volumes in the order that uh, Moorcock thinks they should be read in they're they're well, out see, of order. what he did is he did six books in a row so he yeah. did he did two two yeah. uh, you know six books and then what happened was that's his most popular thing and uh and then he would write elric stories after that and then yeah. he'd try to insert them into the timeline as they went so as he developed and as he developed this world so things are kind of out of order and screwy i would because uh yeah let me see that you know he has it's it, Moorcock's fascinating because he has different worlds. You know, he has this concept of yeah. the eternal champion. So you well, can look at yeah. like the Quorum Chronicles, the Hawkmoon the, Chronicles. The Quorum Chronicles were the very first thing that I that I ever read of his. And then that, that turned me on to Elric. 
Uh, let's see the the uh, the first volume is called Elric of Melnibane, and it uh, what what are the see if it has the stories that are in it. Uh, you should probably start with that one. I think yeah. though the that that's one that starts slow but begins to really roll when you start getting into them. Yeah, book book one is just called Elric of Melnibane. The second one is Stormbringer, and the third one is uh is the White Wolf, and they contain all of the stories, all of the okay. book, those three volumes. And they're they're great. the the uh, The third one, I think, has just come out. I, I, I mean, just very very recently came October twenty fifth. Yeah, I, I still haven't ordered that one yet. I've got the other two already. But they're they're great, great reads. I'm reading them again because they've been out of print for twenty years, and now they're coming back. So yeah, read just just go to Amazon, read get Elric, and uh, search for Neil Gaiman, and that'll bring up the three books. That have all they're there. It's a great uh, what do you guys get an anthology? Uh, flux adding to the uh, chat here, adding to the uh, oh, is that our flux? Is that that's flux, our flux. artist flux? Yep, just, yeah, just Hi, adding flux. to the uh, the depth of our, our conversation. Just boobs, thanks. Yeah, artist, go to go to flux's. Uh, she's got a is it YouTube or Rumble? It's YouTube, flux paints, flux paints. She's very, very nice, very good commentary. Oh, well, enjoyed being on the tube with her the other day. She's good people, and we, we we have other people too. Uh, I'm thinking like we're going to be doing a a a very moddy Christmas, and I haven't decided if we want to get all the all of my mods on one stream together, or sort of highlight one each stream, and then uh, you know the 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 mods that have their own channels can kind of grift their own channels and things. Because I know there's more than one. There's more than Flux. Uh, Valhalla awaits. I know he has a he has a cool stream with goats. <laughs> <laughs> He raises goats. Has kind of a cool stream. I like those. Uh, go to Valhalla awaits too. Uh, well, we got a few more super chats that are rolled in after we after Flux's boobs comment. Uh, Nathan C. Steve, you should do the book on Audible and then sign up as an Audible affiliate so you get commissions on Audible signups. Double dip grift. Yeah, I don't know. There's so many ways you can go. One fellow said he could do it on a Kindle, and I, I don't know. I. I got to get back to work and get on top of my work and figure out where I am and <laughs> yeah. like come and pull my head up and see where I am. I am doing, I'm trying to do more stuff on my rumble channel. Cause the book's kind of, you know, that's, that's where, if you want to support me, Oh, crime, I should promote crimelaw.net. Go there and buy my do book. It. Um, it's right on there. legal topics and it's for anybody really who's interested in law and law related things. But, um, Oh, you got yours. Did you get to read any of it or probably not all your spare time? Right. <laughs> well, like I said, now that the trial's over, that's uh, I'm going to curl up and read that in, in bed this evening. <laughs> yeah, or I'll put you to sleep quick. No, but the uh, I'm trying to do more stuff on my Rumble channel. I've got some really cool interviews. One of my buddies, Ryan Bellinger, who's an office mate of mine, a friend of mine, we talk some very deep philosophy. And then I've got this um, a, a lot. I've got some great interviews coming up. I mean, wait, oh, I can't wait. I, this is this is the fun thing because it's not yeah, like I'm making any money. Yeah, tell us about the interviews you got coming up. I know you got well, a couple of them. Today, I'm going to be interviewing Dr. Brian Cutler. I don't know if Dr. Cutler. Whoop. Hey, oh, see it uh, from the audience again. Brian Cutler is brilliant. He is a um, he is a he is a brilliant academic who talks about eyewitness testimony, problems with memory, problems with eyewitness IDs. He and I wrote a paper together. It's in the book, actually. Uh, he he called me in to help out on the legal side on some of his research that he was doing with Daniel Rumchek, who was a um, mm. on on AI, artificial intelligence, and yeah. facial recognition. And so uh, he's been a friend of mine for a while, and just kind of more of an academic colleague. So I'm going to get him talking about eyewitness identification and the problems with the memory. It's he is the expert in the United States on. I mean, nobody's better. He's written multiple books. He's a very well-respected academic in these areas. And then I've got another person who's coming on. I've got some cool stuff. Just keep follow my Rumble channel and you'll get updates. And Steve Gosney is a good for Canadians. He has sent his book to everybody around the world. I have, you know, and the way I've been working international sales, if it doesn't work, if it doesn't ship to you, is uh, send me your address that you want it shipped to. I'll give it to my wife. She'll figure out the postage. And then there's a donate button too. If you just want to support me, you can donate. So what you do is just tell me I'm donating and I'm, I'm going to donate the difference between the $5 fixed shipping cost and, uh, 
and that. So I, I have done some international transactions that way. Um, it's just too complicated. I'm I'm a hobbyist, not a professional here. Well, can you grift for another 30 seconds? I need to go remove a ball from <laughs> under a table. <laughs> yes. Well, okay, go ahead. I'll, well, I'll tell you about my Rumble channel. It's simply for fun. I don't know how long I'm going to keep doing it, but it, right now it's fun. I'm going to have Stephen Hayward on, who's a Powerline blogger, uh, coming up probably December or January. He is great. He's on the back of the book as a grifter. I'm going to try to get like Nick Riqueda, Andrew Bronco, once I can learn how to live stream. Um, I have another, we, one of my closest friends was um, uh, Derek Brooks, and he is such a beautiful man, and he had an impact on so many people that he touched. And I've got a person I'm going to interview about Derek, and, and so not so much like you need to know Derek, but what he did is he gave us so much as people. So I'm, we're going to talk about, about that, about like how to improve. So there's a lot of like self-improvement tips. There's um, there's a lot of music talk and music suggestions. So it's just basically, you know, me talking about what I like to talk about. So it's sort of just a hobby thing. And, you know, ultimately it's supposed to promote the book, but um, I don't know. I don't know what I'm doing. I'm just, I mean, I get empty nester. My son went to college and now I've got all this time, free time. <laughs> Well, we've, we've moved a few books over the past few weeks, so that's yes, good. Yes, you did. Thank you. And thank you for the people that did buy the book. Second edition is is should be coming to me by the end of this week, and I've got about 15 unfulfilled orders, so I'll get those out as soon as I can. And the, the new book has an extra chapter. It has upgraded cover, upgraded paper, so, um, so that's what's going on on this end of the world. I guess Bronca should Bronca probably wants me to promote his classes too. Cause I'm, yeah. I've got um, two classes, almost two classes from the end of the law of self-defense law school, which I teach criminal law on. And uh, I've agreed tentatively to teach criminal law too. Um, and then we have evidence and criminal justice. And so we're going to be teaching a series of law classes for the non-lawyer um, or for potential law students people that don't want to take the LSAT, people who are interested in law but and want real solid education without the leftist indoctrination and uh, are interested in, and really want a real college experience without having to, you know, it's online, there's not grades. You can, you can take a final to get a certificate if you want, but it's just for the pure joy of learning. So that's what Andrew and I are collaborating on and, and it's going really well. I think it's gonna continue on. And, uh, and like I said, I'm, we're, I'm pretty close to agreement on crim law too. So that's fun too. Andrew Bronco yeah. at law self-defense. And people are giving me crap because I, I took off my hat. He's a beacon of maritime knowledge, <laughs> literally <laughs> a beacon. Uh, yeah. A virtual lighthouse. Yeah. 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 yeah I, I did. I did finally have time after a week and a half to shave my head. So I was looking like a hippie there towards the end of last week. I had like three millimeter long hair. Uh, Stingy says, Humor Maritime Monday, the poop cruise, Carnival Triumph 13. Yeah, that was a bad cruise. Oh, I remember that one. Yeah, yeah, yeah that was in Florida. <laughs> and Judge Julie, I need the series name for that. We already read that one. Uh, get the, just go there and uh, search for Elric and Neil Gaiman, and it'll bring up the three books in the series Elric of Mel, Mel Nibine, uh, Stormbringer, and White Wolf. Uh, Caboose recommendations devices, any 40 K book by Dan Abnett and Sandy Mitchell. I have not read any of the 40 K books. I hear a lot about them, but I haven't read any of them. Uh, spooky spoon. Love you, Jeff. I'll love you too. Spooky spoon. Oh, uh, somebody loves me money for Jeff, but I'm also going to continue pestering Steve to listen to Dominic LaPointe. Dominic LaPointe. Yeah. You know what? I, I'm, I'm lost that sticky. So I mean, I can write this stuff down. See, I, I do everything on sticky. And then when I get done, I toss it. But sometimes I get overly aggressive in tossing the sticky. In. Thank you, Joe. Thank you, Fedorovsky. All right. <clears throat> um, the poll. Okay, here we are, the poll. We are, we're ending our poll. Uh, should I do a spoiler-filled review of the new Netflix maritime-related show, 1899, at the end of the show? 84% of you said yes, so we're going to do that. I still need to watch the movie uh, The Gray with Liam Neeson. That's definitely on the that's definitely on the list. But now that I've got the uh now that I've got this new thing to binge. So I I will do a spoiler-filled review of the new Netflix show 1899. 
uh, starting in about five minutes. And so if, if uh, any of you don't want to have any spoilers about the first episode, which is the only episode I've watched thus far, uh, say your goodbyes and make sure you hit the, the uh, like button and subscribe button on your way out. Uh, another that should really, be a good thing. Another really good book suggestion is the, the Geralt series. What's the one? Oh, yeah. What's that called? Um, the Witcher. The Witcher. Great. Yeah. But the books are phenomenal. Yeah. I, I, they're also some of my favorite. I, I have kind of a, a Witcher shrine in my living room. <laughs> oh, my son! My son gets me into these things, and he's like, "Oh, the Witch Witcher is phenomenal. The whole series is very well written." He's a Polish author. Yeah, Poland, is, got, Poland is like in a renaissance. Poland has got so much good stuff coming out of it, music-wise and literature-wise, and I mean, Poland is is really on their game. And the Netflix Witcher shows are fantastic because Henry Cavill is a huge Witcher fan and he signed on on the condition that they followed and respected the source material. Well, I'm yeah. going to disagree with you on that one. <clears throat> I, my son and I watched that and uh, we don't like, I have a lot of criticisms of the Witcher show of the Witcher television. It's the, the Geralt is excellent. That, that yeah. character actor is excellent, but the writing is very, there's some problems with the uh, script writing in that the books are way better. Oh, well, they always are, but yeah, it but, could I mean, have been Dune, much, much, much worse. But the Dune movie was great. Yeah, the new one. Yeah. <laughs> well, you have to do it. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Come on. Yeah, the, the Dune movie was spectacular. The, the David Lynch movie left well, a little okay. bit to, be, you know, to sting, be desired. Sting, you know, sting. But it was 84. Yeah. <laughs> and Flux says, I have been validated. Steve says, sticky too. What's, I don't get the uh, sticky. I don't, what? Sticky. Well, that's flux. Sticky. I don't... What do you mean, flux? What do you don't mean? Don't be so He's vague. Confusing these. He's confusing. I hate getting confused. Henry Cavill has T Rex arms, though. <laughs> he does. He's great. Kind of the, the casting is. I love the casting. I just don't like the dialogue and script writing. Like Jennifer is the worst. You know, it's like all the f words and the and the motivations. Yeah. They change the some of the story with Jennifer in the story yeah. where she's her motives are not the same and it disrupts the whole flow i'm sorry i'm not i'm not happy with the witcher uh series you're 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 one of the guys that compares the screen to the books well yeah uh, i learned in 84 when the first dune movie came out to separate them in my mind into two separate entities <laughs> but that's why i almost didn't watch the dune movie uh, and until i went oh wait a minute that's the same director that did the new blade runner okay it's in good hands so that's why I watched it. Sticky notes. Uh, no, calling post-it notes stickies. Yeah. Oh, okay. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Stickies. Well, I don't know what he would call them. Post-it notes. <laughs> uh, all right. Well, see, my my deal is if I had to make one complaint about this, the Witcher series, it just just one. I I, I mean, Triss is is far and away my my favorite character in the books, other than Geralt. Uh, she's not getting on a screen time, but I, I, my biggest complaint is that Geralt doesn't talk enough in the TV series. There's not a lot of that inner dialogue that goes on in his head. Well, Yennefer's my favorite character, and they ruined well, that's her. why that's why you're upset. I, I'm, I'm very upset. And then, of course, the uh, who's the 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 the, the dad witcher? The whole th they're just the changes they made are irrational. Oh, and then the the, the, there's the political correct story where like there's the um the elves or what are the yeah. evil elves yeah and you're supposed to feel sympathetic to them or something and then they go <laughs> and they and then they go and kill all the babies i mean I, I the whole i don't know the whole thing is just i i, I gotta say i mean, the book is phenomenal read the books i don't i, oh, I definitely I, read the books the production values of the witcher are excellent Geralt is read, excellent read the books play the video games I didn't. Well, I don't play I, ugh, video games. You should play The Witcher. I the, know. I'm, the Witcher games a... are my favorite, hands down. Okay, hands down, my favorite games ever. That's another topic. It is. <laughs> <laughs> oh gosh. Well, that roach is the best. <laughs> the the horse is not the best actor in this TV series. Uh, maybe it is. Maybe Steve thinks so, but. <laughs> no, I, I like the casting. I think that everybody yeah. except for the uh, the one wizard woman, 
the, and they make oh, yeah, her into the, a yeah. black woman and she's not, yeah. you know, I forget. She, I don't like her casting, but I think the casting is excellent. The visuals are great. Geralt's excellent. And I, I liked it originally, but the, when they started changing the plots on it, I mean, it's like, why? They don't have the talent in the writing and they're putting in this political correct stuff and they change the grace of the character. Then they, they make the elves like some kind of like they're the put upons and, and they, they change the motivation of the witcher guy who wants to steal the blood. And, oh, there's so many changes that drive me nuts. And the Yennefer's motivations are completely out. She's supposed to be the mom figure. And then she's going to betray. I don't get that. I mean, there's so many problems. I'm sorry. I can't get over those type things. Well, as, as Gerald would say, mm. 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 <laughs> 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 this is just free form YouTube right now, right? By the way, if you haven't noticed, we finished with Maritime Monday. That's right. Uh, <laughs> We're moving on to chapter. You can if you're if you're here for Maritime Monday, you've turned the page. Now it's just and, uh, Jeff and Steve goofing off. And and as we bleed uh, viewers and subscribers, we, 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 this is the first. This is literally the first stream I've ever done in six months on YouTube where I ended with fewer subscribers than I had at the beginning. <laughs> oh my God. I'm sorry. I'll be subscribe, off. Subscribe, please. If you haven't already done so, I need your subscriptions. Okay. <laughs> and with that out of the way, uh, magician Sapphire. Hey, welcome. Uh, now I want to see legal vices live stream playing games. Also ghost of Tsushima is a masterpiece. I haven't played that yet. Like I, I have extremely limited time. I, I get like one or two hours of gameplay in a week, just as my ultimate therapy for sitting and making time go quietly and uninterrupted um the last thing we're gonna do is the uh the one take spoiler filled review of 1899 new new netflix show that centers around a vessel sorry <laughs> are you getting alerts yes i'm getting alerts here Ooh, what are we being alerted to i have a prescription ready <laughs> That's so ah, exciting, you know. There you go. All right. Oh, gosh. Right, let's see. Where should we start? Do you want to stick around for the spoiler-filled review of 1899? Sure. What else am I doing? I'm here with you. <laughs> Unless you want to kick me off, which is cool. Um, I'm enjoying it. I really, this is so much fun. I'm a chat representative, right? Yeah, I, I suppose so. <laughs> okay well <clears throat> all right we're we're gonna do this i'm not gonna take any super chats or read any super chats doing that we'll we'll back up and review it later because i'm lazy i'm just gonna do this all in one unedited take and then i'm gonna clip it and upload it <laughs> as, as a standalone short form video uh so we'll Let's see. We'll we'll uh, move Steve here into the the representative position, uh, <clears throat> and uh, I guess at the end of this, Steve, you can you can give your opinion on whether you think this is a series that would interest you to watch. <clears throat> okay, <clears throat> stand by for spoiler filled review of 1899 on Netflix. <clears throat> Ready, everybody? If you don't want to know the spoilers, now is your time to abandon. I'll give you a five-second countdown, and then it's your own fault for being here. <laughs> if you don't want to see it, leave now, and please, on your way out, hit that subscribe button, hit the like button, and come back later and leave a comment for engagement purposes. Four words or more, please. Thank you. Uh, five, four, three, two, one. Hi, Legal Vice is here. I'm doing an unedited, one-take, spoiler-filled review of the new Netflix, Netflix series, 1899. If you don't want to watch it, then go watch the show first and then come back to see how I did. Uh, if you don't care, continue watching because this is me. We have CrimeLaw.net, Stephen N. Gosney, a fantastic assistant district attorney. No, yeah, oh, sorry, oh, hey, sorry. Watch it. That's why we need more than one take. <laughs> An assistant public defender in Florida who is the voice of the people. The voice of the people in this. He's going to say whether this series sounds like something that he would be interested in. Uh, the story starts out with Mara Franklin on board the Kerberos, uh, which is 
named after the dog that guards Hades in Greek mythology. Usually a three-headed dog sometimes has a mane of snakes. So we start out with a little bit of a kind of Greek mythology going on. So she's on board the Kerberos. And she she's she goes through this mantra. Of, she says, "I'm not crazy." Um, she she's having visions of being uh, restrained and uh, and worked on. And she she wakes up in her cabin. She's got some uh, scuff marks, like wrist restraint marks on her on her wrists. And she's trying to figure out what's happened. And then uh, they they introduce another ship, the Prometheus. Also, the you know, the uh, I guess he was a titan that stole the fire from the gods, if I remember correctly. Uh, and he was punished for that. So another, I think there's some serious Greek mythology going on at some level because the 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 vessel Prometheus disappeared four months prior to the beginning of the story. And Mara, she's a doctor, but being a woman in 1899, she was only allowed to study medicine, not actually practice it. And she focused on the brain. And so she's on board the the uh, this vessel. And uh, there's some Dutch people down in the steerage where you know, they're separated from the higher class people. And they, she goes down there, she, they, they break into the uh, dining room and bring her down to help with a, with a pregnancy of one of the Dutch women. And it turns out she has to like spin the baby in the womb and saves, saves the baby in the mother's life. And then they disappear for a while. Then it, it uh, there, there's, there's five seconds of, of uh, impotent male clothed man, woman sex. Uh, of course, you know it was it was it was unfulfilled. The, the the man is impotent, can't get it up and whatnot, and blames the woman. Um, the the captain is a German captain. He seems to be an alcoholic because he's always carrying a little bottle with him and hiding it. And uh, they find suddenly they start getting messages set down there on their uh, telegraph machine. They get the messages from the Prometheus. They believe it's just a set of coordinates that keep repeating and repeating and repeating. And it's about seven hours away from where they are. So they change course to go see if this is the Prometheus that disappeared four months previously or not. And uh, there's, while all of this is going on, uh, Mara, the doctor, she she opens up this letter from her brother that says something like along the lines of, uh, I can't remember exactly what it said, but like meet me in New York, uh, trust no one. Uh, so we're, that, that kind of sets up a little bit of a mystery. And uh, it, by the way, it's a very it's a very accurate portrayal of how these old 1800 steamships worked. With you know, they want to turn starboard, they they have to shovel more coal into the other side of the the engines to get one engine, one side of the engine to be more powerful than the other to turn the ship. So it's, it's, it's really accurate for how the steamships, the coal powered steamships worked back in the day. Uh, now, the captain he also is reviewing a letter that's in the same envelope as the uh, envelope that Mara had. So apparently there's something going on with, with someone in his family as well. That's connected to the Prometheus. Uh, and one passenger named Lucian, he, uh, he looks a little bit shaken when they announced to the, to the, uh, the passengers that they may have discovered the Prometheus and that they're going to be changing their course to go meet up with the, with, with the ship that they believe is the Prometheus. So I'm kind of getting the feeling that, a lot of, if not all of the people on this ship have some sort of connection to the Prometheus. And uh, for some reason, it's not clear yet. There's a, a Chinese mother and daughter that are pretending to be Japanese. And there's a fake priest and his brother. They're kind of acting a little bit weird. And then they, they actually find the Prometheus. They get alongside it. They find out it is the Prometheus. And uh, there's no, there's no reply to their messages. There's no lights on the vessel. So they decide to go down into a lifeboat and go across to the other ship and climb up it. Uh, and so the captain, Mara, and the fake priest, they get in a lifeboat and they row out to the Prometheus, but suddenly all the wind stops. The sea is perfectly calm. And uh, then there's a weird scene that I don't know where this is going. Well, I do know where it's going, but I don't know why it's going there. The Dutch guy that called Mara down, he comes up to the gate. They, they're behind a locked gate in the steerage, and they, he talks to one of the crewmen and tries to bum a cigarette off of him. And this, they comes over and there, there's a good three minute scene where they're lightly caressing, where the two guys are lightly caressing each other's cheeks and talking about how the, how the scar suits him and whatnot. So I think that's going to lead to a relationship between those two at some point. Um, now, when they get to the ship, there's a ladder welded to the side of the ship, which I don't think was accurate. Uh, they still use rope ladders down the side of ships to climb up. And I think if it was a metal if it was a steel ladder that was welded into the ship, there would be a, a good chance of it rusting. So I don't know how accurate that was, but I've never seen a ship with a ladder welded to the side of it. So, eh, 
And now they, <laughs> they get a, on board. That's a picky, yeah. picky maritime guy yeah. for criticism. <laughs> they get on board the Prometheus and suddenly the, the telegraph stops. They stop, the, the, the telegraph stops and they mention that the telegraph has stopped, uh, which so they mean, okay, maybe someone saw them coming and stopped sending the messages. And they start searching for the ship and it looks like it was torn apart. It's only been four months since it disappeared, but it's all, it's all in shambles. It's all torn apart. They focus on a little green bug that's crawling across the, the floor for some reason. And then they get to the bridge. The bridge is completely trashed. There's seaweed hanging from the, hanging from the ship's wheel. And then they notice that the telegraph is destroyed and looks like it had been destroyed a long time ago. And then suddenly it cuts to a mysterious, fully clothed man climbing up out of the water onto the deck of the of the Kerberos. So we don't know who he is, but he's just someone that climbed up out of the water. And getting to the end of our little review here, our spoiler-filled review, if you haven't noticed. Um, the spoiler is only for the first episode, yeah. though. Yeah, they, they find this uh, cabinet on the bridge that the door is is uh, barred shut with uh, with a piece of metal stuck between the two handles, and suddenly there's a big pounding on the door, and they open the door, and there's a perfectly healthy, perfectly clothed, clean, fresh faced young boy in the cabinet, and he just he comes out and he just walks up to to Mara, the doctor who went over with them, and then it cuts to this this guy that climbed out of the door climbed out of the water, standing in front of Mara's door on the Kerberos. And then he puts a little green bug under the door and it crawls under the door. He walks two doors down and enters the cabin. We, so we, we don't know what's happening with him. We see nothing else about him. And then it cuts back to the, the Prometheus with the little boy. He unwraps this, this black sort of obsidian looking pyramid and hands it to, uh, hands it to Mara. And then it cuts to black and Jefferson Airplane's White Rabbit plays over the credits. Hmm. This sounds interesting. Actually, there's a lot of things that intrigue me about this. There's sounds to me like there's a sci-fi mystery type element to it. You said mm -hmm. it starts out with bondage and sex, which is always good. Um, and then, uh, but not, then not it start, bondage, just just impotent sex. Well, that's it was, it was unfulfilled, yeah. unfulfilled. But you know, teaser. He, and then, he blames the woman, of course. I gotta say that <laughs> the gay man caressing thing doesn't intrigue me. But the uh, but the uh, but maybe it's your bag. Maybe it's your bag. It sounds to me like, uh, is this like a Cthulhu kind of thing? I think it was a Flux does, Could by be. Flux in the chats, does Cthulhu <laughs> painting, so I hear. Yes. And E. Copus in the chats talked about Cthulhu. So uh, is that where we're going? Anyway, that sounds intriguing. I'll have to check it out. 1899. Uh, yep. It sounds like my kind of thing. Brand new on Netflix, just started a few days ago, and uh, that's my review of the very first episode. It's intriguing enough that I'm going to watch it. It's all it's on board the ship, so there's kind of the uh, the maritime thing to it. So I think uh, I'll be posting these up. I'll do these reviews every couple of days at the end of the show as I try to binge through it as best I can, and we'll see how it goes. If it's something you want to watch, if you want these spoiler filled reviews, let me know, and that's what we'll do. Uh, so until the next one. Take care. All right. Now that's over. We can get back to the super chats. <laughs> well, what do y'all think? Does it sound like something you'd be interested in watching? Cause it, I'm, I thought the first interesting was captivating. It kept my interest through the whole thing. Uh, it's probably the first series I've ever watched that made me take notes. During yeah, the, it. <laughs> the Netflix, is it available on DVD? Cause Netflix uh, is not exactly the, the organization I necessarily support. Mm, yeah. It's a, it's a Netflix production. Yeah, that stinks. But well, you, you know, know, they, they just have put, to tune in every few days for my reviews. Then I'll just have to. I will see. Yeah, tune into your reviews. I'll get all the spoilers. Is this part of a? <laughs> is it from a book or is it just a new? I film? think it's. I I don't think it's part of a book. I didn't see any based on announcements. Uh, I didn't watch the end of the credit, so I'm not sure. But I didn't see anything mentioned at the first. So I think it's just a straight up Netflix production. Could be. No, no, no it's, 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 there was also another series called The Dark. If anybody watched The Dark, it's done by the same people that developed The Dark, which. Started out really strong and ended up sucking. Now the uh, it's oh you, you thought dark was better? I thought dark sucked, but anyway, eh, that's too bad. Dark just got stupid after the first two seasons. It's like Lost. Lost was intriguing, oh, yeah. but they didn't know where to go with it. Yeah, Abrams just got way lost on that, and then all right, everybody's dead. At the end. Well, it, 
you know, another. I want to know what the another, numbers were. I want to know what the numbers were, and I want to know what that smoke monster was. And they just well, the thing is, them. is that I think ultimately it was like purgatory, you know. And but and hey, there was hey, two what's seasons. What's up? We got Tug, the umbrella guy oh, here. The umbrella guy. I've heard about. It. I've heard he's to be feared. He is. He's to be feared. He's <laughs> dangerous. People hate him. Yeah, like he's a loner, a rebel. There's things about him you wouldn't want to know. Yeah, Battlestar Galactica, the reimagined Battlestar Galactica, was great up until like the last that. episode or so. I I thought it went off the rails when Jimi Hendrix got injected into it. Hated, hated how they ended that. It was such a great show. But um, I, I respect yeah. Umbrella Guy. I do not criticize mm -hmm. him in any way. I fear his power. <laughs> <laughs> He's a king maker and a king breaker. That's He's our right. tug. <laughs> All right, so we got a few, we got a few super chats going through here. Uh, Battlestar Galactic was was cool, but too much religion. Uh, written by uh, the original series was written by Mormons. the The original Battlestar Galactic was essentially a, a Mormon doctrine based thing. The the uh, the Council of the Twelve the Mormons has like twelve apostles. They had like the Council of Twelve, the uh, the return of the lost tribes, the uh, the planet Kolob. There was cobalt in the series. I was just it was a lot of like kind of deep dive pop culture Mormon doctrine stuff in the first one. Yeah, it was two Mormons that that wrote it. <laughs> so, it was said so that Battlestar Galactica is Old Testament, Star Wars is New Testament. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, we got a few super chats here. Hello to the best mustache and my boy Steve. Thank you, Josh three sixteen. Gator, Gators, <laughs> and Kyle Mitchell. Seven episodes in. If you think it's weird now, you ain't seen nothing yet. All right. And can you repeat it in Korean for the Korean viewers? I don't think I have any Korean viewers. If I do, eh, they're obviously good enough English speakers. They stuck around. Hey, hey, Ron. Thank you for my weekly Maritime Monday <laughs> fix. You are incredibly welcome, and thank you for the super chat, Caboose. It's okay, Jeff. All the streams I'm on are train wrecks. <laughs> <laughs> well, it wasn't too bad of a train wreck. Just unfortunately called our public defender a, a DA. And he's and he's still here, so he doesn't hold it against me. No, I don't get offended <laughs> by I really don't get offended by anything. I mean, I must say it's very hard to offend me. Uh Danny just sent me a text. Say, give Steve my regards. He's a champion for and oh, my phone just turned off. He's a champion for joining your early maritime stream. Well, thank you for the invite. Uh, oh, all right. Yeah. Oh, and I, 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 okay. Yep. That's what she said. Give Steve my regards. He's a champion for joining your early maritime stream. Uh, magician Sapphire says, now I want to see legal vices live stream playing games. Oh no, you don't. I'm like the worst game player ever. I play for, for therapy, not for, not for gameplay. Also, we already did this one. Ghost of Tsushima is a masterpiece. Uh, Flux. I've been validated. Steve. Why do I already have these again? Huh? I must be like. All right, there we go. Xcomer said, "I want to watch it now after that review." Well, that's good because uh, we'll just we'll we'll watch it. No, I'll, I'll watch it and do these little reviews. Starship Troopers. Oops, where do you go? Starship Troopers. Only first movie. Uh, the book Starship Troopers is way better than the movie. Starship Troopers is a great book, and the movie wasn't bad. So that tells you how good the book is if you haven't read it. <laughs> Super Troopers. Uh, well, there we go. Oh, I enjoy rewatching DS9. I, I never, I didn't watch the last three or four seasons of Deep Space Nine. I don't know why. I think it just kind of fell off the radar. Oh, Jessica Reloaded says, Legal Vice. Oh, yeah. where'd your message go again? Uh, there we are. Legal Vice says, Tell them they can watch me live playing games. Yes, you can watch Jessica Reloaded playing live playing games on her channel. Uh, so there we are. Guys, I got nothing left. Uh, we're two hours and 53 minutes into the two-hour stream, which is what you get with me and my borderline ADHD. Uh, <laughs> so con consider yourself lucky. We didn't go three and a half hours. Thank you for everybody that was here. It was great to have you all here. Tomorrow, tune in for the background on Courtney Clenny, the only fan stabby murderer. We got stabby McStab face. Now we've got a we've got an alleged stabby, uh, stabby Mc, whatever we want to call her. Uh, Allegedly stabbing her boyfriend. Yeah, to we death. Can't, you got to get something else because we already yeah. had Stabby McStab face. Uh, that was people a great in Florida trial. like to stab each other. Apparently, yeah. If you want to see my my breakdown of review of the was it the Terry trial, oh. uh, the Stabby Mc, I did one. I did a little 
wrap up of great i'm gonna i think i'm this is anything i appear like because when i get committed to a trial i'm in it for the whole thing you know <laughs> i get like enraptured and so i figured i need to close it out so i did like a little grading all the parties on the thing so i gave everybody a grade i did that on the brooks trial now i did it on that that the stabby mcstab oh, face trial that's on your rumble on my rumble channel which is crime law with stephen and gosney Stabby McBlackface. No, that's the very last thing we're gonna call her. <laughs> Maybe we gotta say like it's gotta be some kind of female. Yeah. Uh Stabby McLadyface. Lady yeah, McStabface. She, Lady McStabber. Like she hulk yeah. or she stab. I don't know. Yeah. yeah well, we'll Maybe, we'll, the we'll chat will come up with in. they're gonna come up with something great, yeah. I'm sure. But we gotta come up with a female stabby McStab face. Yeah. <laughs> All right. It is not yes, it is now exactly 1258 a.m. in Korea. Time to wind down for the day. Uh, so you're passing on the 46-day trial of the Pike County Massacre chicken. Yeah, I saw that one coming a long way away. I thought, nope. Uh, anything with the name Massacre in it is going to be a very, very long and committed trial. I could barely handle 10 days of no sleep. <laughs> uh, my dogs hate me. They're all just starting to... Re we're getting reacquainted these days. Uh, Steve, on the way out, anything you, anything you have to grift? Uh, yeah, yeah. Well, I've already been. Thank you for letting me grift. I did a lot of that already. I probably boring people with it. And I people this chat. I mean, these people have already bought, I think, a lot of your chat. So thank you if you've bought the book and, you know, Rumble channel. But really support me if you just want to donate. You can go to crimelaw.net if you want to buy the book, crimelaw.net. Um, and crimelaw.net with Stephen and Gazi's Rumble if you want to keep up with me. This is probably my. I'm going to be posting there. I'm not going to be as active on the um, legal tubers <laughs> as I have been because I'm going back to work and it's just a different world. But thank you for letting me uh, come on and sh represent the chats and everything you do. It's awesome. I, I love your show. You really, you have a good, I think I said you have a good balance of mirth and legal analysis. It's kind of a mirth nice and balance. Murder. Mirth and murder. <laughs> It's like the uh, the the next. Uh, what was the Angela Lansbury show? Oh, Murder She Wrote. Murder She Wrote. Yeah, it's like Mirth and Murder, like the the second generation of that, I guess. <laughs> Mirth uh, and Murder. Now, That's pretty. You got, that would be you. Mirth and Murder. <laughs> <laughs> well, pleb life here. Unless someone comes up with uh, something better than this, I think we have a winner. Stabby McOnly fans. <laughs> Stabby McOnly fans. I, if it, unless well, someone we'll comes up with something better than that, I think that's a winner there. It's a, well, we need to just make a list of good, good suggestions and then have like a voter poll. Yeah. Oh, here, one, do. here's my dog. You want to see my doggy? Say goodbye, doggy. There's, there's a uh, Jackson. Hi, Jackson. Jackson. Oh, Jackson. Jackson. Okay. Stabby <laughs> McOnly fans. What's up, doggo? Hey, he's dog. A, he's, like, he's, gotta be, he's coming in here because he wants to be walked. So I better pass sign off, man. Yeah, I, I can't lift my 250 pounders. I'm just too old for that. <laughs> they don't like to be lifted either. Uh, so, well, that's where we're going to end this thing here. Uh, everybody, he didn't, he wouldn't do it again. So I'll tell you, go to crimelaw.net and order the book. You won't regret it. Like the, the, the forward is the only part I've been able to get through. And I was highly entertained through the forward of a book. The forward How many books can you say that you about? There you go. And I'm, I'm going to, as we, I'm going to sign off. I'm going to walk across the house and I'm going to, jump in bed and read it for a while and go to sleep. All right. Good night, so my friend. Thank you, chat, for being here. Thank you, mods, for sticking in. All of you that super chatted tonight, thank you for that. And those of you that are listening in the background, come back later and give it a like. Great to have you here. And uh, thank you to the people that unsubscribed during... <laughs> during this and the few that resubscribed or or subscribe for the first time great to have you here we'll be here tomorrow with courtney mcclenny until then take care enjoy your legal vices and see you steve bye